false and the vaccine is safe, as 88% of residents 12 and over have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. As for kids, at least 35% of the 5 to 11 age group received one dose of their COVID-19 vaccine, which is higher than the province's 21% average. Although this is the case, there is an ongoing COVID-19 outbreak in a school in Barhaven, where 17 cases were confirmed, and the school says they will remain closed until Thursday. Perushka Gopalkista, City News. Now, the Ontario Science Advisory Table set to release some new modeling figures today as COVID-19 cases just dropped yesterday after three straight days of over 1,000 cases each day. The province's chief medical officer of health is also scheduled to provide an update about the COVID-19 situation province-wide in addition to his regular Thursday briefing. This is Dr. Kieran Moore, who will also likely face questions about the Omicron variant with at least 13 cases detected so far in the province. Ontario's seven-day average of daily new COVID cases is up to 940, a level that has not been seen since the decline of Wave 3 in early June. Officials have said a rise in cases this fall and winter was expected, though, as weather gets colder and more activities move indoors. City News Time 902, now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. And the clouds will increase through the day, a gusty wind out of the west-northwest, and it's a cold one. We've already reached our high for the day. It was minus 1 very early this morning. We'll have a wind chill near minus 15 this morning, near minus 10 for the afternoon. Tonight, mainly cloudy, minus 13, and tomorrow some flurries could collect a centimeter or two the high just minus five thursday varying amounts of sun and cloud with the high again minus five for today already reached the high minus one and right now feeling colder in the wind but it's minus eight degrees in ottawa minus seven in smith's falls everyone managed to get out of a burning home safely on snake island road that was virtually destroyed as 911 calls indicated the house had flames shooting from the roof when firefighters were first contacted around 11 last night uh, fire crews arrived, calling an investigator in immediately to find the cause. The house has $750,000 damage, and three adults who live there are now temporarily displaced. That fire was out just before 1 o'clock this morning. Germany's incoming chancellor has pledged in a, that his new government will stand up for a strong European Union and nurture the transatlantic alliance. Olaf Scholz, a center-left Social Democrat expected to succeed longtime Chancellor Angela Merkel tomorrow as the head of a new three-party coalition. Gira Molson telling us this morning it might appear hard to replace a leader of Merkel's standing, but Scholz is well-primed for this role. Yes, she's a hard act to follow because she is almost Germany's longest serving leader, just about a week or so less than Helmut Kohl. But Olaf Scholz himself is a very experienced politician. He's been Labour Minister during the global financial crisis. He was the mayor of Hamburg. And for the last three and a half years, he's been the finance minister and vice chancellor in Merkel's government. Now, Scholz says he will continue a tradition of German chancellors making their first foreign trip to a close European ally, and that will be France. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. When the headlines say X, he's got the Y. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's on mornings like this. With its bitterly cold wind chill trying to stay upright while walking on the ice that I wish we could have Christmas New Year's and then just skip right to the made too for a long weekend everything else in between I can do without good morning welcome to the Rob Snow show on city news it's a busy day around here if you're into the news if you have a view on the news well you're in the right place my friend great show ahead great content all the way until noon Hollywood on the Rito and to talk about the local film industry it's booming it's booming business is booming and it was booming all throughout the pandemic really one of the big local bright spots was our thriving film industry and we're going to talk about it this morning bruce harvey is the film commissioner with the ottawa film office 
Christmas movies, Christmas movies, big thing in town. They're like a magnet for filming Christmas movies. They love shooting Christmas movies here. Uh, the professor is back. Ian Lee, Carleton University. He has a lot to say. In case you've never tuned in and, and heard the professor. Always has a lot to say. That's why we give him 30 minutes. I'm happy to give him 30 minutes because you just kind of wind him up and let him go. I just say, Professor, what do you think of this? And then uh, I get up, I get in the car, I drive down to the Tim Hortons, I get up in the in the lineup, in the drive through I place my order, uh, I drive back, I park the car, I come back up to the studio. All of this before I've had a chance to even ask a second question. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. And we have a lot of local issues that we're going to really dig into this morning. Like, why is the city of Ottawa getting into the banking business? Now, why is the city of Ottawa lending people money to do home renovations? A new program from the municipal government. It, it says the goal is to reduce greenhouse gases, which is uh, admirable, I suppose, but... Is, is this how the city should be going about it, lending homeowners money to buy, whatever, new windows, doors, insulation? Or should a municipal government, I don't know, stick to things like plowing the snow and salting sidewalks, you know, municipal services, and leave the banking services up to, oh, let me think, uh, the banks. Just an idea. And we're also going to talk about the so-called alternative budget. Now, there's the real city budget, and then there's the alternative budget. There's the city budget, and that's up for a vote tomorrow, when your city council meets for the final time this year. But lately, and in recent years, there's been an alternative budget presented by a coalition of far left-wing municipal organizations. And they have this budget document, and it's what a city budget would look like if the far left ran the city of Ottawa. And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on some more about affordable housing, the housing crisis. And I agree with them that housing is unaffordable, and it is a crisis in the city of Ottawa. I've been talking about that for years. Loyal listeners, you know that I have. But... One of their solutions in the alternative budget to address the housing crisis is a municipal land transfer tax, which they have in the city of Toronto. And they think we should do it here. A city of Ottawa land transfer tax that would be the same as the provincial land transfer tax. So I went on to Rate Hub this morning. Because, you know, when you buy a house or a condo or land, anywhere in Ontario, you have to pay a land transfer tax. And I, I just typed in, they have a handy little calculator there. I, I typed in house worth $700,000, which is a, a typical Ottawa house today. I mean, it's nothing fancy. You're uh, 700 grand, you're not living in Rockcliffe Park or uh, on the waterfront of Crystal Beach, Okay. The provincial land transfer tax on a $700,000 house is a little more than $10,000. Just the provincial land transfer tax is a little more than $10,000. So try and follow the logic here. Because this is supposed to be an affordability measure. The end goal is to make housing more affordable. So one of the solutions that this coalition of far-left uh, community organizations suggests is a new tax to double the land transfer tax. So instead of someone buying that house for $700,000 paying a $10,000 tax, they would pay a $20,000 tax. And that's supposed to somehow make housing more affordable in Ottawa. It's called the alternative budget. See, they call it the alternative budget, I think, because it comes from an alternate universe. <laughs> oh, by the way, the word free, as in free this, you know, free that, this should be free and that should be free. Uh, in this budget, the word free is there 28 times. 28 times. 
Also coming up this morning, the Signatures Ottawa Christmas Show starts tomorrow at the EY Center, Uplands. Crucial event for all sorts of local artists, artisans, and authors. Uh, a lot of them will be doing book signings at this event. We're going to be interviewing some of them this week, in including, we hope, John Iveson from the National Post. He was with us last year, too. We're hoping to have John Iveson on Thursday's show. This morning, Ron Corbett, a longtime radio colleague of mine, uh, fabulous newspaper columnist, one of the best storytellers in Ottawa, and an author and publisher. His company is called Ottawa Press and Publishing, publishes a lot of Ottawa authors, and he's going to tell us about some of the local authors that he has published this year, where you can get their books, why you should get their books, and how you can get those books signed this week at the Signature Show. Really looking forward to that. Rob, Rob, Ron always tells Rob, you when are you going to write a book? Let me publish your book. Let me. I wouldn't even know where to start. Where would you start? We always uh, love talking about economics on the Rob Snow Show. Big week in Canadian economics. Bank of Canada set to make some kind of announcement on interest rates tomorrow. That's what all the experts will be listening in for this week. Some uh, indication as to when the Bank of Canada could start raising its trend-setting interest rate. Uh, especially now, given the very strong labor market, higher wages... Stronger inflation. Just, so just how long will our central bank hold the line on ultra-low interest rates? Is Omicron a game changer? So Pedro Antunes on that. He's the chief economist at the Conference Board of Canada. What does fully vaccinated mean? Is there going to come a time when the definition of fully vaccinated is going to change? Uh, three doses. Instead of two doses, for example, you, you wouldn't be considered fully vaccinated unless you've had a booster shot, a third shot. Dr. Lisa Barrett is with Dalhousie University in Halifax. She'll join us on that topic, and I hope you'll join us for our Talk Back Hour. We do it every morning between 10 and 11 o'clock. Our call-in line, 750-1310. It was a hot one yesterday. I think it'll be a hot one today. Today we're going to talk about the unvaccinated. The unvaccinated, there are millions of Canadians unvaccinated. Some of them aren't eligible for a, a vaccine. Some of them, many of them, millions refuse to be vaccinated. So what do you do with those people? Do we keep doing what we're doing? Have we done too much already? Should we do more? It's been in the news that some countries, some governments, they're really cracking down on the unvaccinated, lockdowns just for the unvaccinated in countries like Austria, Germany, although in some ways their restrictions mirror what we're doing here already. In New York City, it was announced yesterday, Mayor de Blasio, soon to be leaving office, he plans to force every private business to have a vaccine mandate. If your staff in New York City at a private business is not vaccinated, you can't open for business. It's quite likely details to come sometime next week. There will be inspections, and if it's found that your staff is not vaccinated, there will be fines issued to the business. And in Singapore, which is always ranked as having one of the top healthcare systems in the world, Universal, Singapore, if you're not vaccinated and you get sick and end up in a hospital in Singapore, you will pay for your own medical care out of your own pocket. Tens of thousands of dollars. Should we be tougher on the unvaccinated? Are we tough enough already? Are we too tough already? That's the topic for the talkback hour this morning between 10 and 11 o'clock, 750-1310. I told you, we're busy around here. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News.
The food cupboard started about 25 years ago. Again, it was a very small operation in the basement of a church. Uh, and we have been expanding to the point where we needed to have a new facility. So in discussion with the, the city of uh, Ottawa and Jan Harder, the local uh, representative here, uh, we came to this location, which is about 2,000 square feet, located in the Walter Baker Center. We've been here for about two years, and it is much better. It gives us a much broader opportunity to serve our clients better. It's a fairly affluent community in Barhaven, so you wouldn't think that people would really need to have a food bank or a food cupboard. But people sometimes have a temporary loss of their job, uh, maybe new immigrants or refugees to the community. Maybe there's been an injury in the family or something like a pandemic that uh, causes uh, people to run short of food during their, their monthly requirements. So we uh, offer uh, any clients who come and live in our catchment area the opportunity to pick up an order of food every, every three, week, three or four weeks. The need varies from time to time. Uh, we have expanded our offering to include quite a few perishables, uh, eggs, milk, cheese, yogurt, vegetables, um, uh, fruit, uh, but people, people I think know that we need cans of beans and stuff as well too. One thing that we're, we're consistently short of sometimes is uh, personal hygiene products. You go to the grocery store, you buy your toothpaste and you buy your deodorant and shampoo there. Uh, people don't automatically think that to, to donate those kinds of things to a food cupboard. So we end up buying quite a few of those things from time to time. The pandemic has, has affected us like it has everybody. Initially, we had to stop the grocery store uh, food donations uh, so that we didn't have any risk of contamination and, and to, to have a significant number of volunteer work to be done in our facility. We have a, a storefront, so it's like a mini grocery store where you take a cart and you go around and pick out the things that you want. That doesn't work during the pandemic to maintain social distancing and so on. So what we have now is our clients can come in one at a time, they make an appointment, they stand behind a line, and they direct our volunteer to, you know, I'd like Kellogg's Corn Flakes rather than Harvest Crunch, uh, to pick the, the food that they would like off the shelves according to the allocation, depending on the size of their family. And then they take it out, uh, load it into their vehicle or whatever, bring back the cart, we disinfect everything and prepare for the next client. We are very blessed here in Barhaven. Uh, we're a totally volunteer organization. So if you give a, a dollar to us, it goes to purchasing food or to provide some service to our clients. No Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Bruce Harvey is the film commissioner for the Ottawa Film Office. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. What do you do at the Ottawa Film Office? What is the purpose of the Ottawa Film Office? Well, the, the number one purpose is to try and attract uh, film and TV production to Ottawa to increase the economic activity in the city that comes from film and TV, which has been great over the last couple of years. It's, uh, it's actually been one of the stable industries throughout COVID, so it's been very good for the city. And to help grow the, the infrastructure that's here, whether that means you know helping to um, provide training for crew, or finding equipment suppliers that can provide equipment to the city. And uh, our biggest thing, of course, is getting our soundstage up and running. Okay. And how is that going? Uh, it's slow but steady. I mean, COVID certainly kicked the pants out for us, but uh, okay. uh, it, it's, it's still on the go. And uh, we're very hopeful that we'll see shovels in the ground early next year and finally get it up and running. So uh, I'd, I'd have to be reminded about this project. Um, I used to know quite a bit about it. I believe, isn't that a Bayview? Is that supposed to be a Bayview somewhere? No, no, no. Oh, it's at okay. the uh, it's at the, um, the the experimental farm, not the not the main experimental farm, but the Greenbelt Research Farm. Oh yes, That's yes, right yes. Woodruff okay, and right, right, right. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's okay. on the MCC space there. Right, right, right. So, what's the vision for that? I, I, you know, say you know you're trying to get shovels in the ground. Say the day comes when you're cutting the ribbon on it. What 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 will be there? And the big thing that will be there is that we'll be able to host major TV series production. And that's that's been the biggest growth throughout Ontario and actually throughout Canada 
in um, production. So anyone who watches a streaming service, you can see how many new series there are being developed every every day for for those streaming services. And uh, you know, to try and, and produce a show like that in just on location and not in a soundstage would mean that you could have a film crew down your street for seven years, constantly filming, uh, you know, in your neighborhood, and no one really wants that. So you, the idea of building the sound stage is that you can put all your principal locations, your principal sets, in the sound stage and film there, and uh, attracting TV series. That's that's major major economic benefit for the city. Right, right, right. Wow, sounds sounds excellent. So, uh, well, and what what is the estimated cost of that project? Uh, do you know? <laughs> Uh, it's going to be somewhere in the thirty to forty million dollar range. Okay, okay, okay. Excellent. Yep. All right, all right. When you look back at um, the year, how was it? How was twenty twenty one for the film? It's a business? record year. It's a record first time ever in the city of Ottawa from a live uh, drama production side. We're well over forty million in production this year. That's that's money spent in Ottawa. And from the uh, animation side, all of the major studios are putting out more production than they've ever done before, growing amazingly well and doing like really high end work, winning a lot of awards. And in the fa- factual side, you know, companies like Gusto are just are still, you know, churning out great product. Okay. What do you do to attract the film industry to Ottawa? Uh, you know, there's anywhere they could go, I suppose. But um, what in, for example, let's start with like, government incentives, for example. Uh, are commonly incentive. used uh, to lure uh, film production. What, what, do, what do we have on offer here? Well, it's Ontario. Um, Ontario. You know, with everything okay. that, that is throughout Ontario is what we have here pretty much. Um, and there's some, for Canadian productions that shoot in Ottawa, there's a little bit of a bump for them versus uh, filming in Toronto. But the, the incentives are very stable in Ontario. That's a, they're not the highest any, in North America, but they're very stable. Productions know that when they've scheduled two years in advance that they're going to come to a location and film that the the subsidies here will be stable they're not going to go anywhere and so that's a, that's a real plus for filming in ontario but the, the big thing for ottawa is really promoting our locations promoting the quality of our crew which is the, the crews are doing really well they're growing in size they're growing in, in quality of work that they're doing and they're really they're nailing it i mean all of the the new networks that have come here like oprah winfrey network uh, some CBS stuff that they've all been very impressed with the quality of the Ottawa crews. So that's been a very positive thing. And, and that's really has to be handed to the producers that have helped train up those crews. We've got some great producers, some great ones in French language as well that, uh, that have done really well to build up the French language production here. Some uh, longstanding producers, some very new producers that are all doing really good work. Okay. Okay. So this number, Forty million dollars. Uh, give me a, a sense of what that figure represents. Well, it, you would, on average, you would say around fifty to sixty percent of that is salaries that are paid to Ottawa employees. Okay. So, so that's the the cast, local cast and crew that are filming here. That's the locals. Um, the other forty percent would be spent on such a wide variety of things because, as you know, if you've ever watched a film, it's the real world. So everything that's in there. If you know the wardrobe has to be bought somewhere, anything that's built, the construction materials have to come from somewhere here. All the hotels that, that cast and crew stay in, you know, the rental cars that are here, the trucks that are rented, um, you know, the food that's consumed on set, all of that comes from local suppliers. So about 40 to 50 percent of the budget is spent on, you know, third-party businesses throughout the city. Okay. How did COVID impact production? Uh, I mean, you've had a record year despite uh, a really difficult year with the virus. So how, how, how was that managed? Well, it was very difficult for the production crews because mm-hmm. they had, you know, they had to add 10 to 15 percent on their budgets for just handling all of the, the you know, personal protection equipment and all of the other uh, crew that was hired. There are whole new departments that never existed before that deal with COVID on set now. So that's a all new crew that are getting hired and we've got some great people that are doing that work. Uh, so that was added cost, but they, it took a while to get that up and running in the animation side. Of course, everyone works uh, in the major studios here in town. They're all in the same place. They're all working on their computers. And when they had to leave and go home, it took a lot, but the, the companies were quick to be able to find a way to be able to work from a distance and still get the same quality and the same quantity of production going on and to deliver 
you know, for an insatiable need. The, the, when people were home from during COVID and not being able to go out and do other things, they were consuming a lot of product on the uh, streaming services and on broadcasters. So the demand for producers went way up. You know, even though we were shut down totally for three months in 2019, 2020 rather, we still almost hit a record in 2020. And then in 2021, we, we definitely, you know, blew the roof off of the numbers we'd done before. So 11 Christmas movies, holiday movies shot in the Ottawa region this year. So that represents about $16 million pumped into the um, economy yeah, this year. Uh, I think we have another one now. So I think we're up okay. to 12. Now. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, it's excellent. It, you know, it's such great news. Um, what makes Ottawa uh, it, it such a, a great location to film a Christmas movie? Well, you have to just look out the window today. You can see one. Yeah, yeah. There's snow on the ground. Yeah. But the bigger one, I think, is the fact that we have such beautiful, small town looks close to the city. And whether that's you're going to Manitick or Almont or any of the, the cities around, the small towns around, you can get that quaint, small town, warm feel. But then you can also get the modern downtown feel when you go right to the downtown core of Ottawa. And as you, anyone who follows these shows, you know that that's, a big story element, you know, being able to go from, from the big city to the small town, that's, that's you know, a lot of the charm that comes from it. it. It's very similar to romantic comedies, the way that they're filmed, the lighting that's used, the, the structure that's used for the stories, and the locations. Locations play a big part in Christmas movies. Unless you're doing something like the Santa Claus where you're recreating the North Pole, it, in most of the, the TV movies, it's the locations that really play out. And you don't want to have the same location all the time. So being able to have that vast array of locations, like the market's got a great, great look for Christmas movies. All along the canal is obviously fantastic. You know, there, there's so many good looks. We can get a, a, a New York Christmas look down around uh, City Hall looking over at the Lord Elgin from the park. It's, that's a big draw. Excellent. It's a real success story. Uh, con- you know, congratulations uh, to you and your team and uh, everyone involved in the industry. It's great to have a kind of a year in review snapshot of a thriving industry here in Ottawa. Thank you so much, Bruce Harvey. No, oh, thank you very much, Rob. Yep, the film commissioner, Ottawa Film Office. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. <laughs> One FM and thirteen ten AM. 
It's Tuesday, December 7th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now, feeling colder in the wind, but in Ottawa, minus 8 degrees. Smith Falls, minus 7. And here's what's making news this hour. We're expecting a couple of COVID updates from the province today. The Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Kieran Moore, will be adding a briefing to his regular Thursday routine, and that will be held today. The science advisory table will also give the latest modelling numbers. It comes after three straight days of over 1,000 cases per day, and that was just broken yesterday with 887. We're expecting today's numbers to come in the next hour. A new poll suggests Canadians expect this new Omicron variant of COVID-19 will be as bad, if not worse, than Delta. 44% of respondents to an online survey by Leger think Omicron will have a worse impact on the case count than Delta. 43% think think the impact will be about the same. Now, 78% of those asked are in favor of accelerating plans for a booster shot for certain groups of people. Right now, anyone over the age of 50 can register for their booster or third shot starting next Monday. Quebec City-based drug maker Medicago says clinical trials of a plant-based COVID-19 vaccine shows 88% effectiveness against the Gamma variant, more than 75% effective against the Delta variant. The company is going to seek Health Canada approval for a two-dose vaccine. It's also preparing to send the data to the World Health Organization. City News Time 932. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. And he is the poor professor from the Glebe. The Sprott School of Business at Carleton University. Welcome back, Ian Lee. Uh, good morning, Rob. Great to hear from you. Now, you're in kind of the down and out section of the Glebe. You always tell us that, right? Yeah. Uh, Not down and out. Uh, I'm the, in the, the back end I'm of the Glebe. I'm in working right? class Glebe, <laughs> where the <laughs> proletariat <laughs> lives. Right. I'm not okay. high hoity toity Glebe, which is, you know, like Powell, where they have, you know, That's private right. gated streets. I'm pleased yes. to report, I drove down Powell the other day, they've taken down the signs. I think we shame them. So it's no longer, they've a de a private gated Powell. It's back to a public street. They de Powell. Oh they de Powell. Okay. All right. Okay. I wanted to ask you, though, because you have been known to um, complain about this in the past, uh, how would you describe the um, snow removal and sidewalk clearing in uh, your area of the Glebe? How did the city do? uh, Um, I'm I'm very honest with you. Um, I know. know. So far, so good. Okay. Um, I mean, they had one pass down. They cleared the wind rose in front of my, you know, on the slushy snow, and there I am. But that that's life. We Mm -hmm. all have to deal with the wind rose. But they did come down the street. Uh, The test. Um, for snow, uh, with the snow um, issue, if I can call it that, is when uh, I'm talking in the urban core uh, where the streets are very narrow compared to the burbs, and uh, they they, the plow goes down the middle of the street and pushes the snow to both sides. And there's parking on, on one side of the streets typically. And what happens is after two or three snowstorms, uh, the street is literally impassable to two cars. Only one car can go down. And if one car goes down the street and meets another car, you have to find a laneway to, to drive into <laughs> to let the other car go by. Right. And it's dangerous for ambulances. I actually saw an ambulance about two winters ago where this exact problem happened. They were coming down the oh, street really? okay. and there was a car coming toward them and then they were, you know, at this sort of standoff. So it's really the snow removal, I think, that is more of a problem um, as we the snow accumulates than it is. They've been pretty good in the last couple of years about getting the plows down the streets to make sure cars can get down the streets. So uh, that's a good thing because the vast majority of us, as opposed to a, a small extremist minority in Ottawa, the vast majority of us own cars uh, because... We're a big city, we're a big country, and it gets very cold uh, in the wintertime. I want to let's we're going to kind of stick to local issues today, yep. uh, which is a lot of fun for us. Yep. Uh, everybody knows Citibank. Now we have the City of Ottawa Bank. <laughs> yes. The, the Better Homes Loan Program, which is, its goal is admirable enough. Reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Ottawa. I'm just going to read right from the city's literature, okay? Through the proposed Better Homes Loan Program, 
Ottawa homeowners could get a low interest loan of up to 10% of the current value of their home to cover the cost of home energy improvements. The loan would be tied to the property, not the owner. This means that if the home is sold before the loan is repaid, the new owner will assume the balance of the loan. The program will include an online tool to help homeowners decide which retrofits to implement based on cost benefit and greenhouse gas reduction potential. It will also help homeowners connect with qualified contractors and include details of rebates and incentives. What are your thoughts on the city running a loan program like this? I actually think it's nutty. I just, and really. <laughs> it's I, nutty. It, you think it's nutty. Uh, let me explain why. Okay. Let me explain why. All right. The, see, you know, I'm, I'm an NFL fan. And, and uh, okay. although the New England Patriots is not my team, there's the greatest coach in the history of NFL, Bill Belichick. They sometimes call him the professor. And he's got these various quotable quotes. And one of them is, just do your job. The city of Ottawa's job is not to become a competitor to the big chartered banks or small charter banks or to the credit unions in Canada. That's not their job. They are not a financial services institution. They claim they were short of money and had to increase the taxes rate, the tax increase from 2% to 3%. Well, maybe it's because they are squandering money unnecessarily on things they should not be doing. And they say, wait a minute, Ian, how can you say that? I can hear the environmentalists now. Don't you understand? Environmental warming, climate change, this is necessary. People that own their homes have equity. Mm -hmm. They can go to the bank and get money. Sure. In fact, they can get a HELOC yep. or yep. their yep. mortgage is up for renewal. The point is, these are the most privileged people in society, and every study I've looked at over the last 30 years dealing with uh, benefits from government, discretionary benefits, and sometimes um, uh, even universal benefits. Let me give you a quick example. The Quebec daycare. There was a really good study by, done by two very pro-public uh, daycare advocates in Montreal, the, I think the University of Montreal, and what they found was that the people who disproportionately got the large, the lion's share of the benefits were the people in the highest income category, the top quintile. And what I am going to say to you, suggest to you very strongly, is that the people who are going to benefit from this the most are people in the most privileged neighborhoods that have the greatest amount of equity and the highest incomes. In other words, people in the Glebe, people in Sandy Hill, uh, people in Westboro, um, and these are the people who least need help. You know, if they want to really, if they really believe that people need help, then at least target this program by income and say, you've got to show us income that shows that you are of a very, and you can set the threshold at whatever level you think is necessary, but to deliberately to ensure that the most privileged people do not benefit uh, disproportionately or, or at all from this program. And right now, as it's structured, I will predict that the people who will benefit the most because they're the most informed and they're plugged in and they're highly trained and all that will be the people that have the highest incomes in the wealthiest neighborhoods. And, and so once again, yet again, these benefits accrue to the people that advocate the benefits. You know, it's like universal pharmacare. Uh, we already give free drugs to low-income people. 42% of all drugs in Canada are paid for by OHIP and the other provincial agencies. So universal pharmacare is designed to give free drugs to high-income people, like professors, medical doctors. They're the people that live in, and public servants. These are the people that live in the urban core. These are the people that are going to benefit from this uh, program, and there's no justification whatsoever. What do you think about this? The loan would be tied to the property and not the owner. That, that, that seems unusual to me. Is it is, right? and it's, again, um, uh, I don't understand the logic. Um, if the property sells, it's going to sell at a capital gain uh, because that's what houses do. I mean, unless they were sold the day before or, you know, or two weeks before, you sell a house several years after it was bought, it's going to ha will have gone up. That's the historical reality in our country and in this city. So you should be trying to get that money back 
as quickly as possible if you're so foolish as to try and become a backdoor quasi-banker, mm-hmm. well, then you should be trying to get that money repaid as quickly as possible. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure that once the property is sold, it is repaid in full. Although I don't think they should be doing this in the first place. You don't think they should be doing it in the first place? Yeah. No. I mean, you know, if they, if they want to, you know, there's different things you can do. I mean, do. I, to me, I, you know, I'm with, I'm with you. Like, the city should stick to... Uh, trying to make try, you know, to clearing the snow on Ian Lee Street. Uh, yeah. So garbage ambulances, collection. you what know, garbage idea. collection, clean water, you know, a very basic core city stuff, right? Not becoming, you know, we have this term uh, near banks or shadow banks. I yeah. mean, this is, you know, this is banking. This is and, retail and banking. If further, you know, in, in 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 Ottawa right now, with the way the housing market is, anybody with equity, I mean, are they really having? any problems at all getting a quote-unquote low interest loan to cover the cost of home energy improvements come on Rob, let's bring out another point that hasn't been brought out banks are tripping banks are tripping over themselves trying to lend these people exactly but there's another point the federal and provincial governments already have retrofit programs sure and I didn't read anything in that that said by the way we're gonna make sure that people aren't double and triple dipping yeah but those are yeah and those federal and provincial programs are usually by way of a tax credit you know you, if yeah. you spend twenty five thousand dollars, we give you, you know, you, you can. You, I don't right. know how but you get a tax is, rebate on so my much. My point is, it, there's right? no due diligence. Yeah. To ensure that somebody doesn't double, uh, tr- uh, right. you know, uh, right. double dip or yeah. triple dip, and the other thing I'm worried about is governments are notorious. We've just seen it. And this isn't a, a, a figment of my imagination. Governments are notorious at not collecting money back when they realize uh, it, it, w- w- the money that should be paid back, and and we saw that with the CERB, where they paid out hundreds of millions of dollars to businesses and individuals that did not qualify. At the at, from the jump, from the get go, and yeah. the government, both federal and provincial, said, "Oh well, keep we're not going to collect it back." Yeah, keep the money. Now imagine yeah. they lend this money, and then somebody comes up and c- says, "Look, you know." Um, uh, I've had to retire early because of health problems, and gosh darn, you know, this is kind of a burdensome payment. Does anybody believe that the city of Ottawa is going to foreclose on that person? And then people say, well, where's your compassion? So what we're really now talking about is taxing other people to give it a disproportionate and unfair benefit to a small number of people yeah. who have come up with an, a narrative that the city finds compelling. Yeah. This is unfair to other taxpayers because they are paying for it. It's not a free lunch that came from the money came down from Mars. It's coming out of the general revenues paid for by all of us. All right. So all when right. they cross subsidize those people, the rest of us are paying for it. Okay. Speaking of paying for things, uh, you would pay a lot more uh, under the alternative budget from the Ottawa Coalition for a People's Budget. And we'll talk about that next. They kind of pick it apart. Coming up next, part two Ian Lee, Professor Ian Lee from the Sprott School of Business, Carleton University is here, and this is the Rob Snow Show on City News. When it came to opening the business, because I was so young, there was a lot that I didn't know about management, financial management, management of people, um, all around (laughs) management, I think is the word that I I always come back to. Um, I think that I always had a passion and they knew that I wanted to create a space for people to get their hair done, but I had no idea, even having studied business management, what it really took to open a business as well as sustain a successful business. So in 2014, I was actually working with Angela Sutcliffe. Um, She was my business coach at the time and she was like, what's your niche? Like what separates you from other salons? And when we started to really dig, it was the curls. It was the fact that we work with all curl types, curly, kinky, wavy, coily, which is how we identify our curl types. Um, And then you have straight hair as well, of course. Um, But you know, more than 70% of the world has some sort of curl pattern to their hair. And we just realized that that was not being addressed. It wasn't something we learned about in school. So that's, I you know, went to the States and, and I traveled all over to kind of gain the information that I have now to be able to share it with our clients and as well as with other sty- stylists. So in March, when it came, I thought it was gonna last, you know, a week, two weeks, through, I think it started off at two weeks. And I was like, cool, I have two weeks to just relax, that's fine. So I was actually in a position where I was 
not happy, so to say, but I was a little bit happy, to be honest, um, just because of what I was experiencing personally. Now, when that extension started to happen, it was not a great feeling. It was very uncomfortable not knowing how I was going to support myself financially. So I'm so excited about the Academy. It's something that I started and I, I launched it during the pandemic. So I've been teaching for a, a number of years. I've been educating for a number of years. I educated at Algonquin. I've educated at Versailles Hair Academy. Um, and I've also educated in my own space, um, in this space and my old space up on Green Bank. And so it was just a continuum of what, you know, I've been doing for these years. When we have a client in our chair, it's not just about making your hair look great. It's about how do you go home and take the, what we've just taught you and emulate that. So now with a world where people want to quote unquote be diverse and inclusive, what does that really look like in a salon setting? And for me, it looks like being able to invite any curl type, any hair type really, you know, cause I can take care of straight hair types just as well as, you know, I can take care of curls. And we cater to all curl types regardless of what you look like on the outside, we got you. Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. So there's the City of Ottawa's official budget. City Council will vote on that tomorrow. And then in recent years, there's been the Ottawa Coalition for a People's Budget. It's a budget for the people as we welcome back Professor Ian Lee from the Sprott School at Carleton University to the Rob Snow Show. The word free appears in the budget document, the alternate budget, it's called the alternate budget, uh, 27 times, you know, free transit, free after school care, free therapy and counseling at local libraries, uh, free, free, free. But I wanna go through some of the um, proposals in the people's budget and get your thoughts on them, okay? Yep. Implement a progressive property tax. And then let me read you their justification sure. for this, okay? Wealth is a much broader concept than income and includes the assets, notably property, that an individual owns. In Ottawa, housing ownership is deeply unequal along racial and class lines. For this reason, a sharp increase to the property tax can be justifiable. We propose one that has the tax rate rise with the value of the property. What do you think about that? I'm going to have to tune to these uh, people because they're so bereft of any understanding of public <laughs> policy or municipal <laughs> okay. finances. And I say that honestly. I'm not right. saying that as a cheap shot. Okay. They said they're not tied into the value of the property. Of course they are. Are they not, they're not, are they not aware of market value assessment? The more valuable your property, the more you pay in taxes. That's very progressive. That's why market value assessment was adopted. I participated in that debate 25 years ago, wrote an op-ed in the Ottawa Citizen, making that argument that it was a much dust, more You might want to dust that one off and have them republish it. Uh. Yeah. And uh, so this, uh, this it just shows that they don't know what they're talking about when they say that the homeowner uh, the homeowners are, are, are not paying a, a progressive tax. The, there's a second progressivity involved. The m more expensive the house, the higher the income you need to buy the property. And if one only has to look at progressive income taxes in our country, we have to discover we have a very progressive system. The more you pay, make, the higher the rate of tax you pay. And in fact, I looked these numbers up. This will grab everybody's attention because they said we're not doing anything for low-income people. The bottom 20%, and this is a CRA data, Canada Revenue Agency data, the bottom 20% pay 1% of the taxes in our country because successive ministers of finance, properly so, have taken the bottom 20% off the tax rolls. And the second 20%, the, the second quintile, uh, pay 5%. Uh, percent. So the two together are paying 6%. So they said the, the wealthy are not paying any taxes. The top two quintiles, that's the top 40%, are paying about 85% of the totality of of taxation, of personal taxation, personal income taxes in Canada. So that's the first point. That's okay. the very first point. The All second right. point is people that are in more expensive homes have higher incomes, paying higher, much higher rates of tax, and they're paying higher property taxes. 
So a, a property that's a, a price uh, evaluated at two million is paying much higher taxes than a property evaluated at one million or five hundred thousand. Going to their home ownership claim, seventy percent of all Canadians own a home. We have one of the highest rates of home ownership in the world. We're in the top five countries. So when they suggest, they were suggesting without putting any they numbers to it. Deeply unequal. Careful. Deeply but, unequal. You know, hardly anybody. They were suggesting it, the large numbers of people can't own their home. That's simply not. All right, all right, all right. All right. We can't get tied up on just one because there's a um, okay. There's a lot of stuff in here. Increased parking fees from two dollars and fifty cents to four dollars. I'm assuming that's an hour. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, quote: Car owners tend to benefit greatly from city infrastructure and have unlimited access to roads, unlike transit u- users who have to buy a ticket in order to access transportation. That could be deconstructed so quickly. First off, they're not paying for their bus. They're not. The home owner, car owners have to buy their car, the whole thing. They don't get subsidized. Secondly, the, so the car owner, the, the, the transit tickets in Ottawa, in our city, are subsidized 50%. So they're not paying the, for the full cost anyways, and they're subsidized by those wicked homeowners and car owners because the, ho- the correlation between homeownership and car ownership is very high. In other words, homeowners own cars. And, and, and their, their claim that they're not paying for taxes, paying for it for the city infrastructure is nonsense. First off, they're paying it through their property taxes, which are based on the market value of the property. And secondly, one-third of the price you pay at the pump and for your gasoline are taxes, including the taxes that are refunded to the municipalities, the infrastructure tax. That the the gas tax, the, the gas goes. tax, which can and only so, be spent on public transit. Right, so the idea that the people driving cars are not paying, they're paying up the, through the nose. They're paying through the wazoo. So again, these people writing this just simply don't know what they're talking about. But this is the people's budget, okay? It's the people, uh, well, they, uh, <laughs> whoever they are, they don't know what, and I'd the, be more than pleased uh, to tutor them and walk them through the city of Ottawa the budget. Ottawa Coalition for a People's Budget. Listen, okay, all right, look, 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 look. And, and tutor them. And I, I love up. this one. I love this one. Yeah, I love this one. You're on fire today. Uh, there's so much ammunition here. There is. Implement a municipal land transfer tax at the same rate as the provincial land transfer tax. Quote, the land transfer tax reduces the incentive of buying and selling of properties as investment. Well, first, it only applies to the buyer. Okay, reduces the incentive buying and selling properties as investment as there is a higher upfront cost. The tax leads to a less severe housing shortage. Now, excuse me, where is the evidence of that? Okay, Toronto has had for years a municipal land transfer tax. Okay, do do they have a less severe housing shortage than than Ottawa in Toronto? Are you kidding me? Toronto is one of the most expensive housing markets in the world. Yeah. And they have had a municipal land transfer tax for years. They want to basically, Professor, I looked this up, okay? $700,000 is a typical selling price for a house in Ottawa. Land transfer tax is $10,000. It would be $20,000 if these people had their way. What what does that do to uh, anything to do with the housing shortage? How does that solve a housing shortage? And let me d- jump onto that, uh, the latest urban legend, that it's those those damn investors, you know, they're buying the properties investors. as if, you know, if you buy uh, five shares uh, in five different companies, that makes the market go up. Or if you buy, Jay Leno owns a couple of hundred cars, that makes the car market go up. In other words, uh, if you own more than one of the asset class involved, you are making the price go up all by itself because one person owns more than two units of that asset class. It's so preposterous. But let me go even further. The Globe and Mail has the stats today, today, in the Globe and Mail on this, and the, the, this, this mythical, you know, uh, fo- uh, investor, either foreign investor with vacant houses or domestic investor, yeah, yeah. the numbers are very small across okay. Canada. Mm-hmm. It's an urban legend urban being legend. ginned up by people who don't know what they're talking about. Um, I actually heard one person wrote me and said, don't you understand that 25% of all the houses are owned by investors? What a load of garbage. This is not true. It is not true. Okay? And the, the other point is, even if they did 
own, and they don't. But even if they did, you can't live in two properties at the same time. So what does an investor do with their second well, or Well, they're saying if you can't, if you, if you, if you they can't live. it out to yeah. reduce the housing shortage. Okay. Okay. Well, I then let's just skip over the next two proposals, which is a vacant unit tax I of 5%. I imagine you're against that. And a non-resident speculation tax of 20%. The, okay. uh, the government, this is in the Globe and Mail um, uh, op-ed today, showing the number of uh, those nasty foreigners. It's just a, 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 I think it's closet bigotry and racism, mm-hmm. because most of the foreigners coming into Canada, foreign people coming in, are, are non-Caucasian. And this is just a, a, a cheap shot at uh, immigrants and uh, foreign uh, people. And uh, the numbers are very, very small. You know, even in Vancouver, where 50 percent um, are, are, I believe, 50 percent are non are originally non non-residents. In other words, they, they're immigrants. And the, the number of foreigners that own in Vancouver is very, very tiny. Again, the numbers, I won't go into all the numbers. We don't have enough time. Yeah. It's in the Globe and Mail op-ed uh, editorial uh, okay. today. What the about numbers are there. A couple of other things here. I'm actually with them on eliminating the Brownfields program. I think that's gotten unwieldy at the city of Ottawa, the Brownfields mm-hmm. program. But increased development charges. Increase the development charges for transit by 10% on all housing starts and by 15% on single family houses it'll make it more expensive of course make housing more expensive and make it even more unaffordable yeah yeah and um we're doing actually free transit this month it's going to cost what seven and a half million dollars or so for a month yeah i've got my own do you think we could uh, could we do free transit do you think but i I want to deal with this too i have my own alternative budget to the alternative (laughs) budget i bet you do to the main city uh, which is an alternative reality into its uh, onto its own Uh, i'm we have over one million vacant jobs in yes, Canada yes, right now. Yep. It's a crisis. I'm proposing that we give these freebies, but tie it to those people who are able-bodied. I'm not talking people who are disabled or people that are raising young children uh, and they don't have any alternatives. I'm talking about able-bodied people who are at home. Then let's, because I'm, I'm a Marxist. I, I really am, Rob. <laughs> Karl Marx, yeah. listen to me. Sure. Karl Marx famously said, okay. we become more fully human through our labor. So I'm advocating as a Marxist to become to help people become more fully human by getting them into the workforce. And we can do that. Listen, I have no problem giving free transit to people for the first year to help them on their feet to join the workforce. And and for that matter, whatever other uh, benefits we need to help encourage people, go and fill those jobs that are causing such a crisis in our country. We have shortages of nurses. And I'm not talking everybody going to university. We need nurses. We need carpenters. We need plumbers. We need electricians. We need just about every imaginable occupation. I want people to go back to college. I think they're doing a fantastic job. So let's tie, take the alternative budget of this people's budget and tie it in to uh, uh, going and going back to work yeah. to, to fill those one million jobs. Okay. And in the process, making these people more fully human per Karl Marx. All right, comrade, our time is up. We have to go. We'll Thank you, comrade. Soon. Rob. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Professor Ian Lee, Sprout School at Carleton University, here every Tuesday morning. Talkbacks with us every morning right after the 10 o'clock news. That's your turn to have your say at 750-1310 on the Rob Snow Show on City News.
news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, December 7th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now, minus 8 degrees in Ottawa. Smith Falls, minus 7. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. It will be our first update on the pandemic in this province since younger children started being vaccinated and Omicron was declared a variant of concern. New modeling numbers due out today from the provincial COVID-19 science advisory table. Kevin Meisner joins us from Queen's Park. We're getting an early COVID status report at 1.30 this afternoon from Ontario Chief Medical Officer of Health Dr. Kieran Moore. This in addition to his regular weekly update planned for Thursday. He'll have more to say about the rising Omicron cases in the province and doctors in Britain are learning more about Omicron in children. Family doctor David Lloyd telling Sky News a rash is a symptom in a significant number of cases. So we've always had a little small cohort of patients with COVID, with COVID who are getting funny rashes. But up to 15% of the Omicron children are getting a rash, an unusual rash as well. At Queen's Park, Kevin Meisner, City News. City News time, 10.01. Quebec City-based drug maker Medicago says clinical trials of a plant-based COVID-19 vaccine show it's 88% effective against the gamma variant of COVID, more than 75% effective against the Delta variant. The large late-stage uh, trial did not include the emerging Omicron variant. It wasn't circulating during the study period, but Medicago is going to ask Health Canada for its approval for a two-dose vaccine. Federal Minister of Labour proposing some new regulations around COVID vaccinations in federally regulated workplaces. Seamus O'Regan wants to expand this, proposing to make them mandatory in more workplaces. Vaccines would complement the existing measures at workplaces, including hand washing and mask wearing. The rule would be in effect sometime in the new year and will be expanded to companies in things like road transportation, telecommunications and banking. These will be implemented in consultation with workplace health and safety committees. The rules will apply to just under 1 million workers right across Canada. City News Time 1003. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. And the clouds will increase through the day. A gusty wind out of the west northwest, and it's a cold one. We've already reached our high for the day. It was minus one very early this morning. We'll have a wind chill near minus 15 this morning, near minus 10 for the afternoon. Tonight, made in the cloudy, minus 13, and tomorrow some flurries could collect a centimeter or two. The high just minus five. Thursday, varying amounts of sun and cloud with the high again minus five. For today, already reached the high minus one. And right. Right now, feeling a bit colder in the wind. It's minus 8 in Ottawa. It's minus 7 in Smith Falls. Schools are closed around the Halifax area. Some ferry service had to be cancelled, and about 10,000 people in Nova Scotia don't have any power. This was after a severe line of thunderstorms moved through overnight. Now, crews are making headway getting some of the power back on. Unfortunately, after that rain, thunder, lightning storm... Uh, parts of Nova Scotia could get up to 15 centimeters of snow tonight. Provincial police are asking for you to keep your eyes peeled for a missing girl from Lanark. Andrea Lillian George was last seen on Sunday around noon in Carleton Place. An OPP say she could be in the Ottawa area. She is slim, 5'3", with long, bright red hair and was last seen wearing a black jacket. Anyone with information is asked to contact police or Crime Stoppers. And the OPP is asking for anyone who witnessed a crash involving two vehicles Sunday afternoon to contact them. Stormont, Dundas and Glengarry Detachment say this crash happened uh, when two vehicles collided at the intersection of County Roads 19 and 20 in South Glengarry Township. A pickup truck was struck. Two of the injured, including a two-year-old child, were taken to Ottawa hospitals with life-threatening injuries. If you have any information, you're asked to contact the OPP. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. It's time to talk back. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Do you think we should be tougher on the unvaccinated? You think we should be tougher on the unvaccinated? Crack down on the unvaccinated even more? Or are we being tough enough on the vaccinated already? The unvaccinated already? 
Or are we being too tough on the unvaccinated? What do you think? As, say those are your three options, okay? Getting tougher on the unvaccinated, we're tough enough already on the unvaccinated, or being too tough on the unvaccinated. What would you say? I mean, should we crack down some more on the unvaccinated, put even more pressure on them in an attempt to force them to get vaccinated? Basically, what? Separate them from society? 7501310, Or do you think we're on the right track now with our treatment of the unvaccinated? With the, I mean, you think of all the restrictions that are already in place. We have vaccination mandates. There are employment restrictions in government and in many employers, the private employers. Uh, there are what I, what would you call them? Mobility restrictions. Why don't we call them that? Um, limiting where an unvaccinated person can go. That's in place already, right? You can't go here, can't go there. You can't show your vaccine passport. You're not getting in here. Just about anywhere. Okay. Or, or do you think we're being too tough on people already who aren't vaccinated? Hmm, think about it. Some of them have lost their careers because of this. Can't fully participate in society. The same way a fully vaccinated person can. I'm, I'm just curious where you land on this kind of spectrum, this, this range. When we talk about the unvaccinated at this stage of the pandemic, do you think we should be tougher on people who, who remain unvaccinated? I'm talking primarily about people who refuse for whatever reason. They just refuse to be vaccinated. We should we get tougher on those people. Are we tough enough right now? No need to go any further. Or are we are we being too tough? Because we basically shunned them. I mean, it, it, you could say, hey, it was your choice. You made your own bed. As, as my mother used to say, you made your own bed, Rob. You made your own bed. I'm interested in hearing your opinion on this today. It's 750-1310, 750-1310. This is why we do the Talk Back Hour, and that's our call-in line. This is your hour at 750-1310, 750-1310, 613-750-1310. There's a call already. Mike in Brockville. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. How are you today? I'm good, sir. How are you? Not bad, thank you. Should we be tougher on the unvaccinated? I think the way they have it right now is pretty darn good. Like, I'm unvaccinated myself. Really? Okay. I am. Uh, I'm not ashamed of it either. The way I look at it is if the vaccination works, I get it. Okay. All right. Okay. Whatever, man. Um, uh, what do you mean if it works? What do you mean if well, it works? Uh, if, the, if the vaccination works, the, how is this variant getting back into Canada when all when the well it came it, well out. those cases the original cases were uh, came from Nigeria the Cana- original right. Canadian cases where the percentage of the population that's vaccinated is two point nine percent sir like ninety seven percent of the people are not not vaccinated at all in Nigeria so. correct but in order right. to come across on the plane they're supposed to be vaccinated yeah i suppose so yeah okay fair enough yeah, yeah. okay like uh I, I agree with what they're doing cutting down on travel and all this other stuff restaurants for the unvaccinated i have no issue with that right it saves me a little bit extra money from takeout sort of deal, okay you know? right okay but yeah i definitely think they need to work on uh their vaccine get it working properly get it working but, properly okay all right okay okay how but, what would satisfy you that it's working properly you figure well the way it is, I don't believe the vaccine's working because if it is working, how are the vaccinated still getting sick and able to transmit it? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. It's a good no. question, sir. Yeah, like I agree fair question. With vaccinations, one hundred percent. If they work, everybody should get it. One hundred percent. Okay. All right. All right, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Mike's good with everything that's going on right now. He says, and he's not vaccinated. There's another one of them out there. Uh, Ryan in Ottawa. Ryan. Hey. Yep. Good morning, Ryan. Should we, should we be tougher on the unvaccinated? No, I think the current restrictions are pretty ridiculous. And pretty ridiculous. They're no. too, being too tough already, you're saying. Yeah. It's, people should be allowed at least some time to see the effects and, you know, weigh their options. But when people are being forced out of their jobs and careers, it's, 
Canada's not free anymore because not free. Like okay. this. Yeah, but it is free. Like you're, you know, Ryan. I don't, oh, I don't know your vaccination status, forced. but um, no, no, no you're not being forced. You're not being, you're not yes, being forced. Yeah. You're being, you're, you're, you have a decision to make. You have a decision to make, right? Yeah, take a decision. Unfully tested test medicine that's only allowed. A test medicine, because okay. Because temporary restriction. No, that's not true. These are these vaccines in this country are approved by Health Canada, sir. Not by They're, the normal. Uh, process. How, what, what, what do you mean by not uh, by the normal process? What do you mean by well, that? Well, it's a three-year process testing uh, drugs and vaccines, and it's not there yet. Well, I mean, sometimes it takes longer than that, sir. Sometimes it takes a decade or, or more to develop a vaccine. Yeah. Right? But I don't think it's right to be forcing people into it before it's actually gone through the full normal so you think we've we've gone too far already gone too far already yeah all right sir. fair enough sir okay so uh not much takers on getting tougher on the unvaccinated so far two calls in uh unvaccinated person says willing to live with the consequences of being uh unvaccinated and another one says it's not a free country anymore uh theo center town theo Hi. Yeah. Should we get tougher on the unvaccinated? Yeah. What do you I think? think we should follow what Singapore did. If they willingly admit to not taking the vaccination when it's available. You have to pay your own medical free. bill. Pay your own medical bill right. if you get sick with COVID. Yeah. 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 That's so what they're going to do if, in Singapore. That, if, you, if you're along the lines of an anti-vaxxer. Right. And you're, you're one even though you're in the bed in the hospital. And you still, no, 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 well, you get charged. Well, you get charged a bill. Yeah, you get charged the yeah. medical bill. And the yeah, estimate yeah, yeah. the estimate from Bloomberg News that I read was, is treatment at a Singapore hospital for COVID-19 to recover yeah. would be about, if you recover, would be about $25,000 yeah. U.S. Like $31,000 or so Canadian. Well, that, that's, that's not exactly chump change. No, no. I mean, if you can imagine, um, yeah. let's say I don't even know if it would be illegal to do that in Canada. But Doug Ford says, yeah, if you're unvaccinated and we have to treat you in an Ontario hospital, we're going to send you the bill from OHIP. Yeah. You would be in favor of something like that, Theo. Yeah. OK, you would be. OK, interesting. All right, Theo. So we should get tougher on them, you think, Theo? Well, I, I think out in the world, it's on, a, on, a, on an individual basis how you treat the unvaccinated. Like on a person to person level, right? But if it if it comes to somebody that is vaccinated and is asymptomatic and gives it to somebody unvac- unvaccinated and they end up in the hospital, well, the person that had it to begin with to infect the unvaccinated, they can't be held liable because they got their shots. Okay. 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 As far as the legality, right? The legality. But you think the unvaccinated person was being irresponsible? Now they're taking up space in a a, a public hospital, funded on, by uh, taxpayers, uh, and and on, and um, on, on a matter of intentionally not getting the vaccine. Yes, yes, yes. That's someone that refused to be vaccinated. Yeah, refused. Correct. Yeah, sure. Got gotcha, you, got gotcha, you, Theo. We're going to take one more of this segment, then we'll pick it up after the break here. Uh, Brockville, Chris, you're on City News, Chris. Yeah. Hey, Rob. Good morning. So we're uh, yeah, three calls in. I'm asking, uh, should we be tougher on the unvaccinated? We're tough enough or are we too tough? And it's um, three calls in, one, one, one. <laughs> we need to get tougher. Need to get tougher. Okay. Yes. If you're living in a city center with a certain population or if you're a public facing person in your role, then you have to get vaccinated because that's what the rest of us have to do to make this world turn. Otherwise, we're all going to get uh, back into a, a worse situation. And I agree with the previous caller. If you don't want to get vaccinated, that's fine. That's your choice. Right. Don't live right. in a city center and don't work in a public facing job. And yes, you should pay extra for your medical because you are taking wow. a bed from others that are sitting and waiting for other surgeries that are elective or potentially longer term threatening like some cancer treatments yep. and you're sitting there losing your seat because of somebody who's stupid who didn't go get their vaccination 
I, I'm surprised uh, the the support I'm hearing for this move in Singapore. If you remain unvaccinated yep. and you end up in the hospital, you're, we're going to send you the bill for the hospital. Stay. Nothing wrong. So, nothing wrong with that. You wrong. are causing more effort on the. Interesting. System. Well, I'd, I don't know. I'd like to run that by the medical ethicists that we sometimes yep. have on the program. It's kind of yeah, like, well, okay, um, you smoked for 50 years. Now you have lung cancer. So we're going to send you the bill for treating your lung cancer. Well, you do get you, know? you do get charged extra for lung cancer in terms of your insurance costs. If you try to get private insurance for oh, private coverage, insurance, sure, yeah, you yeah, have to yeah. pay extra if you're a smoker. As yes, an example, do. yes, you do. Yeah. Okay, yep. so yep. so there are certain scenarios that you know you purposely are doing this. You know what the output is, and you're making a conscious choice. So therefore, there are ramifications. You still have a choice. Yep. You just have to accept what those ramifications are. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we do please. live in a free country, and that's fine. You live in a country where you can choose. But you have to have pros and cons for each of those choices. All right, Chris. Well said, sir. Nice, nicely uh, done there. Okay, we'll be right back. Should we be tougher on the unvaccinated? Rob Snow Show Talk Back Hour, 750-1310 on City News. It started out with a small outdoor booth in what was called Artist Alley, which is actually the area just outside our store on William Street, uh, where for a couple of years we sold uh, our jewelry uh, directly on the street. And then we slowly evolved to having an indoor uh, location in this building, 55 Barwood Market Square. We then moved to another location in Place de Ville and then moved back down here on Dalhousie Street at Ear Gear in the 90s and then back into this building again in, uh, in 2000 as a collection. I do a collection of jewelry called Cirque that's uh, mainly uh, beaded work with a combination of semi-precious and uh, vintage beads. And then she does a hat collection uh, called Fanfreluche that's all cut and sewn hats in a variety of fabrics and for uh, all of the seasons of the year. We've curated and sourced the artisans that we represent in a lot of different ways over the years since it's been, you know, uh, since 1985. Uh, some people come to us since we're known and uh, other artisans that we represent might uh, recommend that they come and see us. Uh, some people we find at craft shows or we see uh, their work, somebody wears it in and we go and track it down and bring it. And then some people interestingly are with us in one medium and then sometimes they evolve to another. They're all Canadian and mainly local. Um, with the roughly 50 people that we have, I'd say more than half of those are Ottawa Gatineau. And then the rest are from other uh, cities in Canada, Montreal, Toronto, um, Vancouver, etc. If you can afford it, go to a small business and spend some money. It's lovely when you come in and you know, give me a pep talk and tell me how much you love this place and you've been coming here for years. But if you can afford it, please spend some money too because all the pep talks in the world are not going to pay my rent, which is still full rent even when we're closed. Then secondly, if you can't afford to spend money, follow the businesses that you want to support on social media. Go to their Instagram, go to their Facebook, follow their Twitter, and then retweet, uh, share their Facebook page, like and comment, because if you can't afford to, as many of us can right now, to do extra expenditures, doing all of those little things like that will raise the visibility of those small businesses and hopefully for them result in some online or curbside or other uh, business for them. Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Think we should be tougher on the unvaccinated? Are we being uh, tough enough on the unvaccinated already? Or are we too tough on the unvaccinated? Split, uh, split. Right down, uh, well, I can't say right down the middle. There are three, three choices here, but uh, opinion is mixed let's say that i want to get into this with you this morning get just given where we are with COVID 19 it's coming up on on 
like two years of this now? Two years, David. Can you imagine? The uh, first headlines about the virus in Wuhan started appearing in the news media about two years ago now. New Year's Eve of 2019. Uh, the local government in Wuhan confirmed that health authorities were treating dozens of cases of a novel coronavirus. And it was a little more than three weeks later that the whole city of Wuhan, like 11 million people, cut off. They shut her down, right, from the rest of of China. And uh, we were on our way from there. And we're still going, living the pandemic life. Life has really never been the same. We have vaccines now. We have had vaccines for about a year. And the vaccination program in this country was slow out of the gate, but really started hitting its stride, I would say, late spring, early summer. And as of this morning, according to the Globe and Mail, more than 29 million Canadians have been fully vaccinated, representing 76% of the country's total population. Total population. If you take out children under the age of five, vaccination rate actually climbs to 80%. So we've done well, I think. We have one of the highest rates of vaccination in the country, but we have some people. It's a a minority of people. I asked David to find a a number for us this morning. It's millions of people. What did we say? Like, say adults who who have not been vaccinated. What's that number, do you figure, David, in millions? Five million or so? Probably five million or so? If you eliminate everything that you should eliminate, it's going to be about five million. Oh, five million people, right? So it's not an insignificant number. Still not vaccinated. I'm sure uh, out of those five million, there are some medical exemptions, but the the most part, it would be people who refuse to be vaccinated. And there are consequences for that. Excluded from some jobs. Fired from jobs. Excluded from going certain places. Travel is much more difficult. Might not be able to see family members. You know the drill. So is that enough already? Or should we be tougher on the unvaccinated? Do more. Punish them even more. Make their life even more miserable until they have no other choice but to get vaccinated. Or are the current measures enough? Or, hey, given the exclusions that the unvaccinated already face in this country, um, have we gone too far? That's another option. I'm just, I just want to know what way you lean on that spectrum. Steve in Canada. Steve. Hey. Morning, Steve. Should we get tougher? Get tougher. Uh, on the no, no, I think uh, it's all ridiculous. I actually personally think there should be no restriction no at restriction. all. Okay. Why is that, sir? Well, because we're supposed to live in a free country and we're supposed to have personal choice. Right. Okay. And, uh, and I believe that forcing me. And it is forced. Don't tell me I have a choice. If you're going to tell me I can't. Yeah, live but my people, life people, make no, no, people make it's choices all the time. People make choices all the time, Steve. Is, you know what? I, I would compare this to medical rape. Medical because rape. If this is okay. supposed to be my body, my choice. Right. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So why would I take a vaccine? I don't want it. So why would they force me? Why would I have to take it? Well, there are all kinds. Even before uh, we had COVID 19, there were all kinds of. Okay, places where, uh, where where there were requirements for vaccines. Okay, Steve. well, guess what? I haven't had I haven't been vaccinated. My children haven't been vaccinated, but okay. they were able to live a Why normal Steve, life. Steve, but Steve, now we're not. Steve, 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 deep breath, buddy. Rob, Steve, Rob, Steve, Rob. I'm not one of your kids. Don't yell at me. Okay, <laughs> all right. There, there, prior to anyone ever hearing of coronavirus or COVID nineteen, there were jobs you had to be vaccinated in order to to, to work at certain jobs. You had to be all kinds of military related jobs. Your children are supposed to take part. Steve, stop interrupting me, Steve. Steve, No, 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 listen. But they accepted medical exemptions and religious exemptions. Why with COVID do they not? Okay, religious exemptions. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. So I don't Uh, understand. What's the difference? What's the difference? Well, you can still get a medical exemption, right, Steve? No, you can't. They're denying them, and no, no well, doctor will give you a medical exemption. No, and, that's and, not true, and, Steve. And, Steve, it's just not true. Are... No, no, Steve, what you're saying is just not true. It's just not true. You can get a medical exemption. There are people who have medical exemptions. I don't understand why people insist on yelling at me. Like, why are you yelling at me? I'm just asking some questions here. You don't have to yell at me. Uh, Dean in Cornwall. Dean, you're on City News. Yeah, just going, wow. I don't, I kind of yell at you. 
I'm sorry, Dean. You're going to yell. Gonna, right. I'm not going to yell. I, I oh, okay, Dean. Okay. <laughs> should we get tougher on the unvaccinated, Steve? Yes, I think. Uh, you I think, think so? we should. Okay. Why is that, sir? Because, um, well, because all the ones that did are kind of suffering because of the ones that don't. Right. Okay. You think we're kind of still stuck in this because of, you know, say David's figure is accurate. Say five million people remain unvaccinated. Five million people. It's a lot of people. <laughs> you know, if they were their, if they were their own city of the unvaccinated, it'd be the largest city in the country. Dean. So yeah, maybe we should move them all. To that <laughs> no, city. No, no, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> suggesting that. But you think we haven't been tough enough already? I mean, we're firing people, Steve. Like we're firing people from their jobs because they're not being vaccinated. And you know, we're telling people you can't go here, there, whatever. You can't travel. Can't do this, that, whatever. Yeah, yeah, and um, they should also be tougher on people who decimate uh, decimate false information. Okay. okay. Um, and then maybe those who claim to be fully vaccinated that are not. But uh, like, for example, whoever started this stuff about the uh, child dying from a COVID nineteen vaccine, whoever started that, we should go after that person. For example, that was in the news this morning. Oh yeah, and then Fake all news, the websites yeah. uh, that are actually making money. Oh sure, yeah. Yeah. From that, they, they should go after that. Go after um, All right, Dean. All right, Dean. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Yep, 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 yep. I mean, they, they, it's been in the news. I've heard this phrase, uh, a pandemic of the unvaccinated, that that's where we are now. So if that's the case, what should be done with the unvaccinated? You know, don't bite my head off like Steve. Uh, but what if, you know, some countries are doing this uh, lockdown just for the unvaccinated, just for the unvaccinated, you know, things like that. Although when you read a little more about the lockdown of the unvaccinated, um, the measures are actually quite similar to measures that we already have in place in Canada. 750-1310, North Gore, uh, David, you're on City News. David. Good morning. Morning, David. Should we be tougher? On the unvaccinated. Well, they're putting the country in a different situation. Uh, uh, some of our places out there, some businesses are still uh, like not at full strength yet because of mm-hmm. uh, people with uh, non-vaccinated people that can't get in and stuff like that. So it's affecting everything in the country. It's not just it's not just a hospital or anything else. But when it comes down to it, this person that called in earlier here and said, oh, my whole family isn't uh, vaccinated and I'm not vaccinated and why should I have to? If his mother had to get into the hospital to have heart surgery and he couldn't get in because there's so many people, the unvaccinated people in there sick with COVID, I wonder if he'd have yeah, the same a, feeling about yeah, it. That's a great point, David. Yeah, yeah, it is good. And, yeah. and another thing about it is, you see what's happening in the other countries that don't have enough vaccinations. The, the the pandemic is going wild in those countries. Why? Because they don't have vaccinations. Yep. We yep. in Canada live free and it's given to us. It's free. We don't have to pay for the vaccination. It's free. And it's proven its point. There's so many less people in the hospital. There's less people dying. There's less people in intensive care. And our hospitals are starting to get back to somewhat, somewhat normal. Yeah, what, what the old normal for the hospital, which is mean, well, yeah, which means you know over capacity and long waits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's a long, yeah. it was a long wait, but the thing is, you could get in with the COVID. Yeah, you almost have to be dying on on a gurney to get in. Sure. Yeah. Okay, David. Thank you. You make some great points, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll be back after the news. We're a halftime, and it's been very busy today. On this hot topic, should we be tougher on the unvaccinated? This is city news.
1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, December 7th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, minus 7 degrees. It's minus 6 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news this hour. Two updates today from the province on COVID-19. First up, just over a half an hour from now, Dr. Kieran Moore, the province's chief medical officer of health, then at 1.30, the science advisory table, that body discussing the trend it foresees for the next few weeks of COVID infections. Positive number of cases from all of COVID tests in the province has gone up to 3.9% of the more than 26,000 tests that were completed yesterday. 928 new cases have been identified in the last day in Ontario. 48 of them are in Ottawa, four each in Renfrew and the Eastern Ontario Health Units. Leeds Grenville Lanark has three. The province is also reporting nine additional deaths from COVID-19. The federal government is proposing all those in federally regulated workplaces, not just civil servants, be vaccinated against COVID to be allowed to work. Amendments to the legislation expected from the Labour Minister Seamus O'Regan. More with our Parliament Hill reporter Cormac McSweeney for you coming up at 11 o'clock on that story. City News Time, 1033. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. It's time to talk back. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. I think we should be tougher on the unvaccinated or are we being tough enough already on the unvaccinated they face many restrictions are we being too tough on the unvaccinated because of aforementioned restrictions now austria has been in the news austria made news because it had a quote-unquote lockdown for the unvaccinated so this is from reuters news service this uh, broke just this morning probably about three hours ago now uh, headline, Austria plans to lift lockdown, but not for the unvaccinated. Quoting here, unvaccinated individuals will continue to stay in lockdown even after Austria lifts its wider coronavirus measures for the general public on Sunday. Austria's two-week-old lockdown aimed to counter a surge in daily COVID-19 infections with restaurants, bars, theaters, museums, and non-essential shops shut. To all, but take away business, take out business. Hotels are closed to tourists. A week before the general lockdown, people not fully vaccinated against coronavirus had been placed under lockdown, barring them from roughly the same places that are now shut. The lockdown for the unvaccinated is staying, the country's chancellor said, confirming that the wider curbs could be lifted on Sunday as planned. So for two weeks, the country was on lockdown, Three weeks for the unvaccinated. It's going to end on Sunday. But if you're unvaccinated, you're still on lockdown. I don't think that would go over well with some people here. Uh, Sarah in Ottawa. Good morning. You're on City News. Sarah. Hi, can you hear me? I hear you just fine, Sarah. Should we be uh, tougher? Tougher on the unvaccinated. Yeah, I don't think we should be tougher. Okay. Um, the main reason is Dr. Tam herself has said that the unvaccinated and the vaccinated both carry a similar load, viral load. So why would we be considering locking people for a medical choice? And another thing I want to say, I know you said that some people can get medical exemptions. Mm-hmm. My sister has myocarditis, but because her myocarditis isn't because of the vaccine, she cannot get an exemption. And that's because of the Ontario College of Physicians. This is a problem. Like, Okay, so let, so let me ask you, you don't think we should be medicine. tougher. Do you think we're being tough enough right now? Or are we being too tough right now? Do you think we're being too tough right now? Or? Well, okay, vaccine mandates, first of all, is not how we deal with public health issues. We've never in the past done this, where we would put a vaccine mandate out there forcing everyone despite their own personal well, we've had school vaccine we've had school i'm sorry sarah we've had school vaccination yeah, programs for choose, decades right but yeah. you can still be exempted you can still choose or religious right, right? Yeah. Yeah. but now we're firing people we're locking people out of countries we're like and, and that's the other thing too like locking people out of countries that have no uh new variant whereas the european countries have a surge of this new variant but we're not locking those flights. Like, this is a problem. 
Okay, this so you think we've gone too far. You think we've gone too far. So. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. yeah, and the narrative is scary for Canadians. The thing is, is if, if we're afraid, if fear is the narrative, then that's all we're focusing on. It's normal to be afraid. We haven't seen our family for the past two years. Mm-hmm. We've been locked up. But we can't let fear dictate our laws. We can't let fear dictate human rights. Like, we have to look at the bigger picture here. Our hospitals really, like, over crowded the nurses and the doctors are saying no so that's i don't know well the 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 fear is the fear is and we've been through this before uh with with very crowded uh icu units right and um delayed surgeries big backlog of of procedures people waiting a long time already for procedures you know imagine waiting whatever say a year for for a knee replacement or a hip replacement you wait that year and then you're told sorry you gotta wait another three months or another six months because of Um, covid surge that's because of hospitals put in policies out of like to be careful but if you look at chio right chio for the first time had to send children to adult hospitals Mm -hmm. not because of covid it was we said we sent adults to chio they had to send children to adult hospitals for the first time in ottawa because not because of covid because of mental health issues they had to take beds from the cancer patients they had to take beds from eating like every other bed other than mental health was full so this is a problem like we're 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 not looking at the greater pandemic here that is mental health issues that is a rise in addiction a rise in homelessness policies like vaccine mandates put children and women at risk because they're the ones that are lower income they're the ones that are going to have to deal with with not having a job to go to right so we have to look at the greater picture here and vaccine mandates is not the way yeah but another another way to look at it maybe there are always consequences for any choice someone makes okay but like the other person said right he had said how um okay yeah if you smoke sure yeah um you pay a higher insurance rate yeah sure yeah yeah. that's private insurance you're 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 comparing apples to oranges how so we have to compare the same thing private insurance yes might be more if you choose to smoke okay if you chose to get private insurance to not get vaccinated that's another option let's bring in private insurance to canada sure Mm -hmm. people can consider that then you have free choice then you have informed consent Right, but you can't compare apples to oranges and say, oh, well, if you don't get vaccinated, you better pay for your bills. Well, well, no, like, we don't do that to anyone. No, we don't do that. That, And that was a point. I I made that point, Sarah. I said, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't say, well, we're going to send you the bill to treat your lung cancer because you smoked for 50 years. Exactly. Yeah, okay, fair enough, fair enough. All right, Sarah, thank you, 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 thank you. We're a free country. Okay, we're a free country. We're not a free country. We're a free country. We're not a free country. Uh, nobody said Hitler yet. All right, that's a victory for me. Jordan in Orleans. Jordan. How are you today? Sir? Oh, I'm hanging in there, Jordan. Uh, yeah. yeah, you and I both. Should we be uh, uh, tougher on the unvaccinated? Or are we too tough right now? Or are we just tough enough? The Goldilocks of tough. What do you think, Jordan? Gold, Goldilocks of tough. I mean, <laughs> to, to, to a degree. I mean, okay. I'm going to be honest. Um, you know, I have family members that I, I am vaccinated. Yep. I have family members that are not. Okay. Uh, I fight with my wife. I'm a new, new father, one right. year old. Um, I fight with my wife all the time because they want to see their, you know, grandpa and grandma and everybody else. But um, long story short is I, I feel I agree with the mental health of your of your last caller. All right. Mental health is a big issue. Yeah. However, the reason why I'm calling is people like Steve is uh, I find a lot of the people that are not getting vaccinated have not been directly um, affected by COVID, whether it's a family member, a, a mom, a dad. It's always been in the news. It's always been a number. It's always been somewhere else. Um, you know, I have a, a close, close friend that has his wife die of cancer, has three boys, chose not to get it, and then died of, of COVID. So, I mean, it's, and that is what actually kicked me in the butt okay. to you know, right. be more serious. So, I mean, to, to hear these people that say, you know, it, it's, it's not your choice or you can't force me, you always have a choice to do whatever it is. And there's a consequence to your choice. And that's the way it's got to be. I mean, I don't want my son and, you know, and, and family members to die from this just because. And, and, and to be honest, I know people, I wouldn't say they're friends, more acquaintances, that 
uh, still go out that are unvaccinated because they have they, there's fake information out there and restaurants don't really look at it. The hostess right. at the front that's 18 years old isn't going to know a fake one from a real one. And they're okay. still going out. They're still going to movies. They're still going to hockey games. Right, right, so, right. Okay. Yeah, should we be more strict in those circumstances? Absolutely. But I don't know. That's... That's a tough one, right, Jordan? It's, yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's frustrating I got you. Either way, you hear it both from both sides. However, it's people's lives, and until you've been directly affected by it and lost a love, a loved one, then you actually realize, oh wow, you know, like, and and I've never heard of until now in listening to your show about um, you know getting charged. You choose not to get it. Well, that's in Singapore. That's in Singapore. Yeah, no. Yeah, well, the no, thing is, Singapore. Singapore. The thing that makes that so interesting is Singapore is annually ranked as having one of the best healthcare systems in the world. It's universally accept, um, accessible. You know, it's government paid healthcare, yeah. um, similar to what we have in Canada. Uh, they do it a little different there. You actually have a, you have a, what they call a social welfare account and you can put so much of you, they take 32% of your earnings right off the top of every paycheck, but you get to decide where it goes. Do you want to put it into education or retirement savings? You get a little bit of discretion there and how to account for it. And you put a little bit of it in healthcare every month. And uh, in Singapore, uh, um, they say, if, if you're not vaccinated and you end up in one of our hospitals, we are going to bill you. We're going to send you the bill to treat you of COVID. And, and maybe that's the next step. Maybe well, that's how we I get don't even know. I, I mean, don't know if it is what that. it is. And yeah. do we need to go that route? Absolutely not. Yeah. But uh, yeah, whatever you got to do. It's you popular. Gotta... It's popular. Yeah, it's popular. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you know, there are lots of countries doing lots of different things. Um, you know, lockdowns for the unvaccinated. I mentioned in Greece. Uh, in Greece, if you're over the age of 60 now, Vaccinations mandatory, mandatory for everyone over the age of 60, and uh, you will be fined every month that you're not vaccinated. They're going to fine the unvaccinated person over 60, 100 euros a month. Every month they're not vaccinated. It's $142 Canadian, according to the Google currency converter. <laughs> okay. And in Singapore, those who choose not to get vaccinated will have to pay for their own medical bills if they get COVID. Uh, the treatment, they say, typically costs about $25,000 U.S., which, again, according to my Google currency converter this morning, is $32,000 Canadian. You know, imagine Doug Ford says, you're not vaccinated. Oh, hip's not paying your medical bill. You're paying your medical bill. I doubt it. I doubt it's even legal. But what if? What if? What ifs are always fun, aren't they, David? Aren't they? Isn't it fun this morning, Dave? Uh, Mo in Canada. Mo. Hello, Rob. Hello. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, hi, Mo. Should we get tougher on the unvaccinated? I, I think consistency is better than toughness. Okay. So uh, do what they can, and uh, you can be dictating certain things. In, you know, it's a cost. Are we still going to pay for it when people get sick? Yes. But I think consistency is better and uh, make sure that uh, you you lock the airports equally to the Europeans and the third world countries. Like, has more uh, uh, outbreak than uh, third world countries. Yeah, plus, I mean, with, with Pearson, like, if you think about Pearson, uh, you know, we've yeah. identified whatever it is, these seven countries or ten countries or whatever it is. Yeah. Did, 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 how many people are traveling into Pearson direct flights from those countries? Of course, most people are not flying direct at all. They're going through some of the busy hub airports to arrive exactly. at Pearson, right? It's so exactly. ridiculous. Yeah. 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 I have another thing to say to you, TA. I apologize on behalf of uh, us Ontarians. Okay. You're, you're, Nova Scotians are polite people. Yes, they are. And yeah. uh, that guy should give you the uh, benefit of doubt and let you speak. Uh, wonderful okay. people East Coast. I lived in Ottawa since 1989. Yes. And uh, it, it's real. I apologize for the rudeness. Nah, don't worry about that, Steve. Don't, uh, yeah. or Mo, Steve. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've talked to Steve before. He's very passionate about the issues. And some people, when they're passionate about the issues, they get all fired up and they want to yell and scream. And somebody, you know, you, sometimes you just have to tell them, whoa, I tell, I tell, I calm tell down, take people. a chill pill, you know? Or, yeah, or hey, uh, you know, I'm not going to force you to take the chill pill, Steve, okay? I'm not going to force you to take the chill pill. 
Don't worry. We're not going to have a chill pill mandate, Steve. <laughs> All right, I need to chill. Everybody with me now? Hum. Hum. We'll be right back on City News. Well, we all loved our rock t-shirts growing up, right? It was our badge. Hey, we went to this concert. We knew that band inside out. So we, we kept doing that and kept promoting that. What's, what's sort of happening now is that audience is dying. <laughs> I always say the earth is flat. <laughs> so the 60s rockers are falling off the end of the earth. So you don't see as big a sales anymore because my audience is disappearing. What's sort of helping uh, to promote that history is the kids are buying vinyl. And luckily we have a vinyl shop in the neighborhood here, uh, Record Center. So what's happening is I've seen kids come in with their dad and the dad say, hey, do you have any Beatles shirts? Do you have any CBGB? Do you have any of this? I said, well, why? Uh, you know, he said, well, because my daughter's into it. She's wearing my T-shirt. So slowly it's coming back, right? The kids are, I think, getting fed up with the generic music that's out there. And they want to click into something that, first of all, links them to their parents, something that they uh, thoroughly enjoy now, and maybe they're passing it on to their grandkids. Pandemic has been a couple of things, definitely hard on everybody. So much uh, uh, messaging that's out there that people don't understand, stats that every day, Jesus Murphy, like I'm getting a headache just reading this stuff, right? So, so really it was just trying to understand where we were going to go from there. The city of Ottawa all of a sudden said, everybody's got to wear a mask. You got to wear it on the bus. People were scrambling, okay? And I had, uh, the store next door had really big windows, so I just flooded the window with masks. Well, that was the, the activity that saved the business. Uh, people were coming in buying two, three, four masks at a time at 20 bucks a pop here. <laughs> but my masks were so different. They were the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Queen, all the pop culture. Everything else out there was medical masks. <laughs> and right, so people said, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to show my rock and roll. So it became the new, the new T-shirt, as far as I'm concerned. Well, what I've done, I'm Hintonburg. I'm at now at one 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 four A Wellington Street, which is next door to the Fab Gear Store. <laughs> And the reason I've changed names, I've rebranded the store, is because I was planning on retiring. And, and in December, I went, oh, I'm not going to retire. But I've committed to changing what the store is about. So I came up with a new name, Fab Gears Rock Shop, where legends are dressed, <laughs> and essentially get that message out. I prefer if the shirt don't fit, you come in, you try another one on. People like to feel the fabrics with clothing. It's amazing. You all come in and go, Oh, I love that. Oh, can I try this? So that's the big difference. I'm not out to make a gazillion dollars. I stick the way I am, old school. I take cash, we take cards. Come on in and talk to the owner. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show, the phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now. Rob Snow Show continues. Well, I don't know how we're going to top this talk back hour tomorrow, Dick. It's been a hot one. Should we get tougher on the unvaccinated? New York City, they had the lame duck mayor, terrible mayor, uh, Bill de Blasio, just an awful, awful mayor of New York City. Uh, terrible, terrible. This is from this morning's New York Times. New York City to mandate vaccine for employees at private businesses. Quote, New York City unveiled plans yesterday, Monday, to require on-site employees at all private businesses, from bodegas to multinational banks, to get vaccinated. The most sweeping local mandate in the United States and one that is intended to limit the spread of the new coronavirus variant this winter. The mandate, almost certain to face legal challenges and to pose difficulties for the employers tasked with enforcing it, will apply to about 184,000 businesses. It is set to take effect December 27th, just days before Mayor Bill de Blasio leaves office. Mr. de Blasio described his action as a preemptive strike designed to stall another wave of virus cases amid rising concerns about the Omicron variant. 
This is the biggest crisis not only of our time, but in the history of New York City. Mr. de Blasio said in a news conference, we cannot let COVID in the back door again. Um, legal challenges, oh, I bet there will be that and, and, and more. Imagine if Jim Watson said, uh, I, I don't even know if Jim Watson has the authority to do something like this, but Jim Watson comes out uh, days before he's leaving office and uh, he decrees Every privately owned business in Ottawa has to make sure their employees are vaccinated or they will be inspected and face a fine. They'll be inspected and they'll be fined if they don't comply. I mean, these are some of the measures that some governments are taking. This is why I wanted to ask this morning, are, are, should we get tougher on the unvaccinated? Are we being too tough? You can make the case that we're being too tough. Look at what we're doing. We're firing people from their jobs, limiting where they can go. Um, or have we um, kind of struck the right balance here with some of the limits that have been imposed? The unvaccinated, what should we do with them? Uh, Devin, Kinburn, Devin. Yes, well, I'd like to congratulate the views of some of the very, very progressive people that phone you up. Mm -hmm. uh, the fellow uh, by the name of Chris or Christopher, um, he sounds progressive and very in support of a corporate closed corporate governance with um, with uh, well the government that we have I guess or the governments that we have provincially fed especially federally wow he sounds like a real all right all right all right uh, Devin okay so Devin, I let's I'm, focus here buddy I think it's too tough too tough Fair enough. okay I had um, stints put in. Stents, yes. And okay. back in 2010, I I have um, I have a pacemaker, and I have to be very careful. I don't get and spike uh, proteins, and you know get an inflammation. Okay, I'm All right. agreeing with the lady that called in earlier. And green, um, green whistle so I have lady. reasons I don't, I don't, now. My okay. doctor right will not be allowed by the. He told me he's not allowed to give me um, an exemption. Okay. Because the College of Physicians and Surgeons and his um, people like Moore of Ontario. Dr. Uh, Kieran Moore, the chief medical allowed. officer. Okay. He's not allowed. Well, to we're going to, gonna you know what? You know what? We're, it, well, let's do a fact check with that. Okay. David has, he knows people down there. And he'll fact check that. You know, has the Ontario College of Physicians said doctors in Ontario are not allowed to give medical exemptions? Is that true? They're not allowed at all? Like, is there like a blanket ban on medical? I will formally like submit just, a request. How hard can that be that. to find yeah. out? One I phone call, we right find now. that yeah. out, right? Uh, Carlton Place. Ryan, because I keep hearing this, but I don't, I don't buy it. Ryan, Carlton Place. Good morning. How are you? I'm great, sir. Great. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Are we being too tough or should we be tougher on the unvaccinated? What do you, what do you think, Ryan? Five million people uh, not vaccinated, give or take. I'm, I think uh, I think that we should do no restrictions. No restrictions. Okay. No restrictions. Um, because, like, where's the data that shows that going into restaurants with all these restrictions is working or not working? Okay. Um, you know, being having pe making people take a vaccination that's in, that hasn't been properly proven should be wrong until it's proven and tested properly. And what, 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 what would it take to make it well, just proven? Like, like any other, like any other vaccine. Like um, any other vaccine. Okay. You know, it's it, it's been tested and proven. Well, it has um, been tested and approved by Health Canada, though, right? Not Health Canada. Properly. We haven't had enough time to even do that. I haven't had enough time. Okay. That's not true. So you're very you're you're worried about like what's in the vaccine or whatever, right? Right. So what it well, is. Well, that right? and uh, and just you're you're mandating it for people that don't even need it. So people, what are the what are the stats? Um, someone that's you know 30, 40, 20 years of age that uh, have yeah, you know, chances chance are I probably don't need a vaccine for yellow fever either. But I can't travel to certain countries without having a vaccine for yellow fever, right? Right. Yeah, well, that's yeah. not all. I understand, but that's that's fine. But yeah. you, uh, I don't. I don't have to take a vaccine for yellow fever. 
What's that? Sorry? Yeah, they're, not, they're, not they're not firing me. No, they're not them. mandated. No, they're not. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I'll grant you that. Yeah. It's just, it's just, I think that you look at Florida, they have zero restrictions, and there are cases that are one of the lowest in the United States. So you look at all that data. So why are we doing all these lockdowns, putting people out of business, firing people over something that's, that's not even happening? They're just assuming it would happen. But unvaccinated, partially vaccinated people in Ontario make up 12% of the population. They make up 77% of the admissions to ICU. Stunned silence. Uh, Anne in Ottawa. Anne. I, you know, so many idiots, so little time. Um, uh, you, you know, one thing, you know, they say, oh, I don't mind getting tested. I just don't want to get the vaccine. Okay, how about making them pay for the tests? I do not okay. want our medical system paying for you to be a dummy, okay? okay. Um, if, right. you, if you want to stand on that hill, pay for it. I, I just, I, uh, that, I, I have no patience with these people. And no, we should not get easier on them. We should get tougher, if anything. I, I think tougher. stores okay. shouldn't even let them go in and buy groceries. Oh, really? I, I, okay. I guess. <laughs> All right, okay. That's my view. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Um, do you have time for one more? i, I got to take this one. 11 minutes. Can't leave somebody on hold for 11 minutes and I'll take their call. Kate. Thank you so much for taking my call, and I'm yeah. really glad I followed Anne. One minute, so, one minute, one minute. So many idiots. Wasn't it Anne's family who had COVID? My family didn't have COVID. I don't know if I, Anne's I followed, family had COVID. Uh, Anne's family had COVID. She she came on and said how she was taking care of her family, uh, older relatives, whatever. And I don't, no, you I know don't what? Think I think that's absolutely horrible that they had COVID. All right. COVID is a virus that is going to go through, like your expert yesterday said, everybody. Everybody is going to get COVID. Yes. And it's time that we live with it. Gotta live um, with. I, I want to clarify too. I don't think uh, there should be no restrictions. No restrictions no, at all. No, no. And I, I want to clarify. You had an expert on yesterday that said there's five. There's a vaccine where children require to get it five times. I would like to know what vaccine that is. I think he misspoke. There's a five. Well, oh, that was Doctor Doug Manuel. Doctor Doug Manuel, senior scientist, Ottawa Hospital. So yeah, well, I understand. And you right. know what? Doctors can be wrong too. Mm-hmm. And and Pfizer has been wrong. Um, just look at all the lawsuits they've got based on their science. Um, but uh, your your doctor had said that there was a vaccine that children require to get five times. I don't ever remember. And my child is fully vaccinated, except for COVID. Um, except for COVID. That, okay. That that, right. that they have to get. Well, I got yeah, you, Kate. No. I gotta go. I'm overtime. Oh, I'm I, I know. I know. No. No. Look. Look. You. Like. You're the last call. I tried to fit you in. I said you had a minute. I gave you a minute and a half. Be happy I had that long. The news is next. City news.
one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, December 7th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, minus 7 degrees. It's minus 6 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Two updates of note from the province today over COVID. We get the latest from City News reporter Irene Preckland. We will soon hear from Ontario Science Advisory Table. It's usually sent via email. It will be the latest projections and showing where case counts are going, as well as the impact of those numbers on things like hospitalizations and ICU admissions. While we have been seeing an increase in cases, hospitalizations haven't been climbing as quickly, and a majority of those getting very sick continue to be the unvaccinated. The province's chief medical officer of health is also set to provide an update about the COVID situation in Ontario. That is at 1.30. Dr. Kieran Moore will probably face a lot of questions about the Omicron variant. Irene Preckley, City News. City News time, 11.03. The positive number of cases from all COVID tests in the province is 3.9% of the over 26,000 completed in this most recent uh, number. 928 new cases identified just in the last day in Ontario. 48 of them are in Ottawa, four each in Renfrew and Eastern Ontario's health unit, while there are three new cases in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark. The province also reporting nine additional deaths from COVID-19. The Federal Minister of Labour proposing some new regulations around COVID vaccinations in federally regulated workplace, not, as, not just the civil service. Here's City News Parliament Hill reporter Cormac McSweeney. The Trudeau government has already instituted mandatory COVID vaccinations for employees of the federal public service, air and rail travel sectors and the RCMP, with those not getting the shot being put on unpaid leave. Now it's looking to expand that to include all federally regulated workplaces, which includes the road transportation sector, telecommunications and banking. The Minister for Labour, Seamus O'Regan, is proposing the new regulations, which should come into effect early in the new year. In a statement, he says he'll be consulting with key stakeholders holders as they try and finalize the wording. He says this will complement existing health and safety protocols like masks, hand washing and physical distancing. Some federal employees are challenging the vaccine mandate for the public service, but that process could take years. Cormac McSwinney, Parliament Hill. City News Time 1104. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. And the clouds will increase through the day, a gusty wind out of the west-northwest, and it's a cold one. We've already reached our high for the day. It was minus 1 very early this morning. We'll have a wind chill near minus 15 this morning, near minus 10 for the afternoon. Tonight, made in the cloudy, minus 13, and tomorrow some flurries could collect a centimeter or two, the high just minus 5. Thursday, varying amounts of sun and cloud with the high again, minus 5. For today, already reached the high, minus 1. And right now in Ottawa, minus 7 degrees, it's minus 6 in Smith Falls. And the OPP is asking for anyone who witnessed a crash involving two vehicles on Sunday afternoon to contact them. This is from the Stormont Dundas Glengarry Detachment, who say the crash happened at the intersection of County Roads 19 and 20 in South Glengarry Township. An extrication was required. Two of the injured, including a two-year-old child, were taken to Ottawa hospitals with life-threatening injuries. If you have any information about this, you're asked to contact the OPP. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Strong voice. Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. You read him in the National Post, Looney Politics, Tri Media. If you become Prime Minister, he'll write you a speech. Syndicated columnist Michael Tobe is back with us on City News. Good morning. Hey, Rob. How are you this morning? I'm great. Great. Great to hear from you. So let, let's go through your latest column for Troy Media. The Ontario okay. Liberal Party is going to hold women-only candidate nominations in almost two dozen ridings ahead of the provincial election, which is now less than six months away. What do you think about this policy? Yeah, it's rather preposterous, as I, as I called it, and it's a word that I don't typically use when I write, because I, I try to avoid it, because even if you think it is, you, you shouldn't say it too often. It's a, just a stupid policy. It really is. 
And you're right, 22 ridings provincially, the Ontario Liberals have decided or have deemed to be, will be only women-only nomination meetings, which means that if there are any male candidates from any walk of life who want to run in these various ridings, which are located in places like Toronto, uh, parts of Windsor, Hamilton, Bay of Quint, uh, parts of Muskoka, et cetera, et cetera, Mm -hmm. ridings that are winnable for the Liberals, Places where they're sometimes competitive, places where they're not competitive at all, and a few where they don't have a chance. Um, They're basically tipping the scales in a different fashion, which they claim is a way to create parity or to create equality. But it really doesn't. And yes, I know that the Ontario Liberals are not the first political party to have ever come up with this, Rob. This this, uh, procedure for women-only nominations has been used throughout the UK, for example, all three major political parties left and right have actually used it and it has also existed in other parts of europe as well but just because they're used in certain places in certain countries doesn't mean that we should emulate them or replicate them and very simply the reason why it's stupid is the ontario liberals who are trying to create in their minds gender parity are doing quite the opposite because they're basically suggesting that women cannot win these ridings unless the the playing ground isn't fair it won't be a fair fight and that doesn't make it fair. And quite frankly, women have been very successful in politics in the sense that they have run in nominations, won nominations against male candidates and other female candidates. They become party leaders, leaders of countries. They don't need this extra advantage. You know, women obviously believe that they're equal, and they are. They are competitive in politics. They have been for a long time. They can stand on their own two feet, as I'm sure any woman who would call in today or any female candidate who's currently in power would say it is unnecessary and almost tone deaf in this day and age that the Ontario Liberals would put it through and it's really ironic that it's actually the Ontario Liberals doing it because you know the Conservatives are obviously opposed to it a lot of new Democrats are opposed to it and interestingly a lot of known Liberals have spoken out against it when you lose your own people and you lose your own party support or supporters you know it's a bad policy yeah, it's interesting. I'm just looking at so many GTA ridings here. Um, you know, Don Valley West, uh, yeah. you know, Etobicoke, Guelph. What else do we have? Mississauga Center, Mississauga Lakeshore, Oakville, Oshawa, yep. Scarborough Asian Corps, Scarborough Rouge Park, yep. Medina, Fort York, Thornhill, Toronto, Danforth, um, York, Southwestern. You know what's not on here, though, is, what's inter- is the riding of Vaughn. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I wonder why. Yeah, I wonder why. Uh, who, who's in a, who's going to be the nominated candidate there? Oh, I guess that would be the leader, Stephen Del Duca. Ooh. So, oh, anyway. I think so. <laughs> Del- oh, we better check his gender. Um, but you know okay. what? All kidding aside, it is yeah. really preposterous. And I I know that when they did some interviews via the CBC and other media organizations, they found some women who were firmly opposed to it and others who were supportive but when you really think about it and i think a lot of them were sort of hit with it pretty fast and hadn't really thought of both the pros and the cons there really aren't any pros there are mostly cons to this and it's not beneficial to women at all if anything it makes them look weaker and that is not something that say my wife believes in most women i've worked with in politics believe in or that any woman should believe in it's just a bad policy okay what do you think of the diplomatic boycott announced yesterday by the biden administration of the beijing games what do you expect the trudeau liberals to do uh follow along that's what we always typically do even though actually canada has been talking about it probably a little bit earlier than the u.s naturally we talked about it we're disappointed unhappy et cetera, et cetera, but we haven't moved on it however i think that the u.s is doing a good thing overall and now to be fair the united kingdom has already you know moved in that direction but the u.s will obviously allow other western democracies to pivot that way and follow them and quite frankly i know that a lot of people myself included would have preferred that there was a full boycott of the olympics because that would have had greater impact i can certainly understand why a lot of governments and western democracies don't want to hurt their athletes but they want to obviously show how frustrated they are with china in the way that they handle the 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 pong shui incident and various other human rights abuses and other things that have been going on with the communist chinese government for quite a long time so at least if nothing else 
It's not perfect, but a diplomatic boycott to me at least makes sense. It's a fair compromise. Yeah. It doesn't go okay. all the way, but it does just enough to state that even if the Chinese government doesn't care, and they don't, they don't. Basically, Western yeah. democracies are saying this is wrong, period. Yeah. The embassy, the Chinese embassy uh, spokesperson in D.C. said, well, no invitation has been extended to U.S. politicians. <laughs> so, <laughs> well. so, in other words, like, who cares? Um, exactly, but, and they know, don't. Yeah, I they mean, don't. but in, in yeah. fairness, China doesn't care about criticism from the West in general. We know that no matter what the issue is. We can talk as far as the coronavirus all the way to human rights abuses to Tiananmen Square. They don't really care. And, again, that's their position. That's their decision. They're not the only country in the world that operates that way. Vladimir Putin's Russia is not much different. North Korea has not been that much different. But in the end, ultimately, I still think this is the fair thing to do so that the athletes can go. They've worked hard for several years. They can go out, perform, hopefully win medals for Canada and other countries. And the countries don't have to boycott the entire Olympics. At least a statement or a stand has been made. It's not perfect, but it'll work. Okay. Bob Dole, Republican Party stalwart, presidential yeah. hopeful, passed away this week, 98 years old. 98 years old. And what a life. What a life lived. Um, has He was being treated for advanced uh, lung cancer passed away this week. Your thoughts on yeah. that life and career, the life and career of Bob Dole? Yeah, it's an amazing life. He lived in 98. You know, he was a 1996 presidential candidate for the Republican Party, lost to Bill Clinton in that election. Um, he was a senator in Kansas for about 27 years, up until about 96, I think from 69 to 96, if I'm not mistaken. He also served in the Kansas House of Representatives. He was in the House of Representatives itself. He had a long and fruitful career. There's no question about that. Bob Dole, to be fair, was not my type of Republican in the sense that he was, generally speaking, on the liberal slash centrist side. Not all, not throughout his entire career, but the bulk of it. But you know, and again, for a lot of Republicans growing up in the ages of Goldwater and Reagan and others, we all respected Bob Dole, and that was the one thing that he always commanded. He was a he was a nice man. He was an honest man. He was a decent man. He was a loyal Republican and a loyal conservative as well. The fact that he thought differently on certain issues, that, that's par for the course. It's a big tent philosophy in the Republican Party, as it is for all political parties. So that's perfectly fine. But he was also representative of a type of politics we just don't see very much, or a type of politician. You know, very much a people person. He worked very hard both in senior capacities and junior capacities. His role was always to be a firm representative and a strong representative of conservative values. But he was also a person who, as you saw throughout his career, worked hard to build political bridges with others, even Democrats, you know, Democrats who he didn't necessarily agree with, but saw ways that they could align themselves on particular issues. He also worked very hard to ensure that American politics was always held in high esteem no matter who the candidate was, no matter who the sitting member of parliament or a sitting member of the House of Representatives or Senate was, in general, he was a person who loved politics. He obviously loved his family and his wife, Elizabeth Dole, very much. He was a very caring, compassionate person. It's just a shame that he never, unfortunately, obtained the one thing that he did want, which was to sit in the White House for either, <clears throat> pardon me, one or two terms. I mean, that in itself, very briefly, is unfortunate because... There could have been a way that the 96 presidential election against Bill Clinton could have been closer, and we only discovered it later on. Bob Dole's sense of humor, which turned out to be one of his great assets in life, he later wrote a book on humor as well, which I would highly recommend to people. It's very well written, very interesting. Hmm. They, they tried to control the narrative with Bob Dole too much, where he almost became wooden in front of Bill Clinton, and you needed someone who emulated life. Bob Dole could have actually done that more often, but his handlers held him back. And because he was a traditional politician, he couldn't bring himself to actually fit that role. There were many sides to his personality, all of them very good. He was an impressive figure, an impressive person. And much like losses like John McCain and Colin Powell before him, there were a lot of great men and women in politics that were losing. You know, for Bob Dole, he was an impressive figure and one that conservatives and others greatly admired. May he rest in peace. Thank you, Michael Tobe. We'll speak next week. You bet, Rob. Yep. Take good care. You too. Bye-bye. Syndicated columnist Michael Tobe. Ron Corbett, storyteller, author, 
newspaper columnist, longtime radio colleague of mine on great local reads for this Christmas season. Coming right up ahead of the um, Signatures Christmas Craft Sale, which is uh, on this week at the EY Center. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. An old-fashioned, traditional grocery store. You're gonna find a butcher, okay? You want a steak cut a certain way, you're gonna get it. You know, there's flour piled in the warehouse. There's mixers on the floor. There's flour on the floor. Uh, the bakery's rented out to Frank Niccolo. It's him and his son come in at night. They mix the dough, they roll the dough, and they bake the dough. It's not the traditional uh, frozen and thaw and put it in the, in the bin, okay? It's made from scratch seven days a week. It's probably the only bakery left in Ottawa that does that. You know, then customer service. You know, we're, we're, we're big on that. The, uh, the cashiers, the, the deli, you're, you're not, if so, you ask for something, they're not gonna point, it's an aisle number seven, they're gonna bring you there, okay? If you have too much groceries out, we'll take it out to your car, you know what I mean? There's nothing we don't do for our customers. And we evolved around our customers. They would come in and say, you know, can you try getting me this? You know, can you get me this? So that's how we built the lineup we have now, okay? So we have a lot of unique items that someone that uh, came over to, you know, live in Canada hasn't seen this particular product, but we sourced it and we have it for them that, you know, like something they used to have as a kid. We have a lot of those unique items, a lot. You know, uh, from Germany, like all over the world. And we source it through, you know, uh, distributors in Montreal and Toronto that bring in the product in bulk, and we piggyback off of them. Probably the uh, the largest European deli in Ottawa. We 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 sell lots because people buy lots. It's nothing really complicated about that. You know, we turn over a lot of product. You know, we package it properly. We buy, it, and we're always uh, consistent. You know, you're always going to find, you know, cutty turkey breast. You know, San Daniel Mortadella you're always going to get the same brands. We don't flip back and forth to save 20 cents. It's always the same brands the last 29 years. Best sandwiches in town. It's simple. It starts off with fresh bread every day baked in the store. Anything that's left over goes to breadcrumbs. So you're getting a fresh bun every day that was baked probably four hours before you get here. Okay. Not only baked, made, like, you know, mix the flour, roll the dough, proof the bread, and bake the bread, okay? Then all the ingredients come right off the shelves. You know, your lettuce, your tomatoes, all your condiments, and they're cut up fresh in the deli. Not like the big, you know, ch corporate restaurant chains that your lettuce comes in shredded in a bag, you open it up and you throw it in the bin. You know, takes, you know, two or three days to get here from California, how long is it in the bag? The big difference is like making a sandwich at home and you don't have to do the work. It's really what the trick is and using the freshest ingredients possible. With Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. The Signatures Ottawa Christmas Show starts tomorrow, EY Center, Uplands. Big event for local authors. I know they're happy to have it back. And from Ottawa Press and Publishing, Ron Corbett is back on the Rob Snow Show here on City News. Good morning. Well, it's great to hear from you again. Uh, how's business? How's business? <laughs> <laughs> that was always I got like what, Rob? What was the second question? No, that was the first question. Yeah. Rob, uh, business is better than it was last year. Let, let's get That's to that. Good. Business is better than it was last year. Uh, there were capacity levels last year. Um, so it's better. Um, that being said, it's still not pre-pandemic out there, I would, no, no, no. I would say. Uh, and your mention of the signature show is a, is a good example of pre-pandemic and, you know, what we're living through now. Uh, we are having some book signings. Some authors are dropping yes. by that show, and we are having our first book signings in nearly two years. Um, Chapters has not brought back book signings this year. That, there's a difference right there. Book signings at Christmas used to be huge uh, for authors. Uh, we all loved it. Uh, this our first time in nearly two years. We yes. did a virtual Maybe event last year, that, Rob. Ron. You may remember that. Yeah. But uh, this year we actually are doing our first signing, so that feels great. Yeah, and maybe speak to that. Uh, what, what 
how important that is to the local authors to be able to get out and sign the books? Uh, well, it's important of, well, well, in a few ways. Uh, from, a, from a straight business point of view, it's, it's a great way to promote your book. Right. Um, uh, from, you know, from a non-business point of view, if you're an author and you've been holed up for a year writing a book, uh, it's lovely to speak to people that have read the book and they have liked the book or are interested enough in the book to come down and talk to you. Uh, you know, talking to, you know, half a dozen people who, you know, like the book can keep you going for another year as you hold up for the next year. So that engagement is a word, uh, you know, but just speaking to the people that read your stories is a, is a wonderful experience for the authors. And uh, I know they're, they're thrilled to be uh, to have that experience again. All right, so I know that you're going to be there, but you have so many great local authors. Uh, you can see the, all of, of uh, the Ottawa Press and Publishing offerings at ottawapressandpublishing.com. You have um, Andrew King's books on yeah. there. Uh, we also have uh, the Phil Jenkins books. Uh, Laura Byrne Paquette. We're going to interview Laura Byrne pa- Paquette later in the week. Yeah. Uh, she, uh, I have not read the book, but it's apparently a real winner. Ottawa Road oh. Trips, your 100-kilometer gateway guide. Getaway guide. Getaway guide. That, um, that Laura's book may well end up being the, the top-selling local book in Ottawa this year. Wow. Uh, Laura is a wonderful journalist. I, I worked with Laura at, uh, at Ottawa Business News. Before it was Ottawa Business Journal, I worked with Laura. She's just uh, one of the best journalists in town. I think Laura's written the definitive day-tripping book to Ottawa, and it's the neat thing about that book is Laura's broken it down into sections, so if you want to do a day trip for an afternoon, 10 kilometers, there's a 10 kilometer getaway section, 20 kilometers, you know, you can plan your day trip. Uh, the information is just exhaustive, and uh, yeah, that book has been selling great all year long, and Laura is going to be at the show, the signature show, most of Saturday. She has two signings, 10 to 12 and 2 to 4, so um, yeah, she's got a great little book. Yep. Uh, Randall Denley's with us every week, of course, longtime uh, post media columnist. At, he's with us every week. We talk about uh, Ontario politics and what's going on at City Hall. Randall's got this uh, uh, great series, uh, and he'll be there as well. Yeah, and uh, uh, Randall has the, uh, the Chris Redner. We, we Chris Redner mystery Chris series. Chris Redner yeah. mysteries, which is yeah. Ottawa based. Cool thing about yeah, that it is, series yeah, is yeah. it's completely yeah. Ottawa based. There's even the Ottawa citizen in this story. Yeah. Randall's not strayed too far from home, although it's completely fiction. So well, Chris Redner writes for the newspaper, right? She writes she's for the a, newspaper. She's yeah. an investigative journalist. Yes, That's right. Is. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's a great series. Now, Randall is there with his own booth. Uh, not to confuse people, we won't be selling uh, Randall's book at the show because he has his own booth at the show. But uh, he he's there and looking forward to seeing Randall again. John Iverson, let me just go through who will be there for signings just quickly. Laura is there all day Saturday. John Iverson, good friend of both of ours, yep. uh, is there on Friday evening. Uh, we published a fiction book of John's, The Riotous Passions of Robbie Burns. Uh, John, uh, you may know John Scottish. Did you know that, Robbie? Yes, I did. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> John, John, yes. Knew that about two minutes, uh, two, two seconds after I talked to him. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He's written, uh, he, he loves Robbie Burns. Uh, and he's written an historical fiction uh, on Robbie Burns. So it's, uh, it's a great book. John will be there on Friday. Autograph that book. Phil Jenkins has... Um another long-time journalist, columnist in Ottawa. He, uh, he has two books that we've published, uh, An Acre of Time, an old classic of Phil. We've reissued that. And as I walk about, a collection of walking columns uh, he did for the Ottawa Citizen. Phil's there on Sunday morning. Excellent. And you'll be there every day. There. Right? There. You're going to be there every day. I'm there every day. The show, I, uh, Ottawa Press and Publishing, is my company, so I'm the publisher. I'm there Wednesday through Sunday. I'm there for the duration. The show starts tomorrow at 9 a.m. Oh, I can remember. I mean, last year with not having this show, it was just, well, I mean, it was a killer. Point. It was a killer. I mean, it was a killer. There was yeah. no show last year. That's why we came up with the idea of the virtual signing. And readers, you know, they, they, they love this. And I, I can understand why the virtual signing was a success. I'm not going to complain about it. It was the best we could do that year, last year, and it was very successful. Uh, you know, the authors will sign your book. They'll inscribe your book. If you're looking for a Christmas gift, if you know anybody who's Scottish who likes iron beer or something, right, uh, right. John Iverson, Friday night. So it's a great opportunity to meet, to meet the authors. And uh, I'll, I'll be there. I have some books there, of course. I have a couple of books, The Last Guide books. I also have some fiction books, the Yakabuski series. So I'll be there yes. signing those books. So them. you have, and I, we only have a few minutes, so we have two minutes left here. You have this character... Frank Yakabuski, yeah. and you've developed a, a mini uh, mystery series yeah, around um, yeah, Frank Yakabuski series. Like, what a 
What an iconic name that is, Yakabusk. It's such a valley name, right? I mean, if you actually go up to like around Whitewater or whatever, I was driving up around there, I don't know, two or three years ago, you come across this Yakabusky Road. And I'm like, yep. yeah, of course there's Yakabusky Road up here somewhere. There's probably two or three Yakabusky <laughs> Roads up yeah, there, right? Yeah. Um, so you have the Frank Yakabusky Mystery Series, but you have, you have also you've signed a book deal, and congratulations on that. Oh, you've heard um, of this. Okay, With yeah, Penguin yeah. Random House in New York uh, to start a new mystery series. Tell us a, a little bit more about that, Ron. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, it's, it's quite exciting. I, I've signed a book deal, Penguin Random House in New York, uh, to so this American the publisher, uh, to start a new mystery series. I signed a book deal with them. I, I got a new agent uh, a year ago, Gail Hawkman, um, out of New York. It's just goofy how things fell into place. Um, I won't make it too long, but Gail Hawkman is a, is a top flight agent. She sold it to a top flight editor, Tom Colgan, at uh, Penguin Random House. They're quite excited about it, and um, so we're starting the series. Uh, the first book is available for pre-order now. It's out in April, so I thought I, I wouldn't buy something that's available in April, but it is out there if you want to read about it. It's called The Sweet Goodbye. Uh, yeah, and that's a new series. starts in April. Congratulations again. Thank you. And uh, have a great time this week with you and all your authors. I hope you sign thousands and thousands uh, of books. Hope, listen, <laughs> if, you, if you don't want to buy a book, it'd be nice to talk to people again. Drop yes, by. I hope we get the, the opportunity to see you. Thank you, Ron. Talk Thank soon. You, yeah. uh, Ron Corbett, Ottawa Press and Publishing. And uh, the Christmas show, signature show tomorrow, EY Center. The news next, and then we talk about, oh, not Christmas. Omicron. After the news. City News. in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. This is Tuesday, the 7th of December. Good morning, I'm Jason White. Right now in Ottawa, it is mostly cloudy and minus 7. In Smith Falls, it's minus 5, but the wind makes it feel closer to minus 12. Here's what's making news this hour. Breaking news from the province and Ontario is extending its pause of lifting any more COVID restrictions until we know more about the Omicron variant. The provincial government announcing it will hold off on lifting any more capacity limits in higher risk settings where proof of vaccination is required, like in nightclubs and 
and wedding receptions in meeting and event spaces where there is dancing. Ontario's latest COVID-19 predictions are out, warning that if we don't reduce our contacts and increase vaccinations, we could soon be back to almost 3,000 new cases per day. Even without the new variant, new COVID-19 modelling predicting that rising case numbers will once again put a strain on our hospitals by the end of this month. Today's COVID-19 numbers, Ontario reports 928 new cases and nine more deaths from the virus today. There are currently 165 COVID patients in intensive care units across Ontario. 95 of those people are on ventilators. Lanark OPP still searching for a 14-year-old girl last seen Sunday in Carlton Place, but who may be in Ottawa. 14-year-old Andrea Lillian George was last seen around noon Sunday. She's white, slim, 5'3", with long, bright red hair, and was last seen wearing a black jacket. Anyone with information is asked to contact police or Crime Stoppers. City News Time, 1131. I'm Jason White. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Firm. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. So for most of us, most of us, fully vaccinated means we've had two doses. Uh, either Pfizer or Moderna or AstraZeneca or mix and match. What if eventually, because a lot of people are going to be getting booster shots, it's going to be 50 years of age and older here in Ontario. It will qualify for a booster shot as of December 13th. And we have had experts on the program who suspect that eventually that is going to include just about everybody will we'll get a, a booster shot. So does that mean that eventually we're going to have to change the definition of what it means to be fully vaccinated? That you wouldn't be, say, for example, considered to be fully vaccinated uh, unless you've had three doses, uh, that booster dose. Dr. Lisa Barrett is back on City News with us. Infectious disease specialist, assistant professor in the departments of microbiology and immunology and and the Department of Medicine at Dalhousie University, Halifax, Nova Scotia. All right. Good morning. There we go. Got all that out there. Thank you, doctor. (laughs) That was a lot. Welcome back. (laughs) Welcome back. Um, Do you think, what do you think, um, will we eventually have to change the definition of what it means to be fully vaccinated? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, This is one of the times in history where science moves as quickly as it can to bring us forward and keep us protected as quickly as possible. But of course, that also means that um, things get tested. We know they're safe, but what's the difference in sufficient and optimal is still something we're working out. And what I mean by that is we know that in many people, two doses of an mRNA vaccine or um, AstraZeneca plus an mRNA are sufficient to protect, uh, but maybe not optimal. And uh, we're still trying to work that out. There are other vaccines that do require three doses. A great example would be the hepatitis B vaccine, uh, while others just need two doses of vaccine. Um, So still trying to figure that out yet. Um, But I think people should worry less about that at the moment, uh, as opposed to making sure they get their first and second doses. That's exceptionally important. Okay. Okay. And why do you say that, doctor? Why do you, why would you say that? Well, um, still uh, the biggest hammer in our prevention and COVID control toolbox is vaccination. Um, It prevents people from dying. It prevents people from going to hospital. Even if we have some changes to, you know, we went from the original to the Delta variant, Mm -hmm. vaccines still protecting against hospitalization and death. So that's really, really important. And vaccines also help to control if not entirely prevent, spread. And when we're thinking about the next number of months and holidays, it's really key that we're not just uh, letting virus kind of get to really high levels. Uh, We're not quite at that stage yet. So first and second doses, priority, priority, priority right now for folks. And the additional doses for those who are immunocompromised or older is also important. So we've spoken to many experts over the last uh, week or so who, who tell us, I'm sure you'll agree, three doses in a vaccine, not unusual. 
right? Yeah, Not unusual, exactly. Right. Yeah. Lots of childhood vaccinations come in threes. Threes like a magic number kind of thing. Uh, yeah, and and that's for different types of viruses. You know, uh, right. we get uh, and they're spread out over multiple numbers of years. Um, th- usually, that's to protect against the the, the highest uh, risk time periods, and we boost them along the way. But you know, the number of studies and research. Um, studies that have been done to figure out exactly how many doses people need. Uh, We often uh, fall down on that piece of the research. Um, Again, we go for sufficient but not optimal. So hopefully this is the start as well of funding research that will really, really help us in the real world uh, make sure we know exactly how many doses people really need. Okay. When you think about uh, we're about, I don't know, seven, eight months now into the vaccination program here in Canada. Okay. Um, right. And now we're talking about third doses. Uh, there are some, I don't know if you would call them concerns, uh, as you say, the science, the understanding of the science, I guess, is evolving about how quickly the efficacy has sort of waned here what, what do you think about that doctor about the so-called waning efficacy of s- some of these yeah, vaccines? I'm very very careful about that okay so I think right. uh, we've taken a br- very broad brush when we're talking so to be clear we don't have a perfect measure of what great immunity is we're taking a lot of our information from what we would call real world studies of vaccine effectiveness and that means looking at a population of people looking at two doses and how often people still get infected or get reinfected. And that's been uh, the core part of our data, which is important data to have. But we don't honestly know, number one, exactly what um, the perfect measure is that tells us that immunity is waning other than the real world. And number two, um, the data around whether or not a third dose, especially in younger people, uh, is particularly useful is still evolving. So do we know that all immunity wanes to the point of being susceptible to COVID infection again? We don't in younger people. In older people, we do know. So to answer your question, do we know that all immunity wanes? We know that some people's immunity wanes with two doses and they need a third, older and immunocompromised folks. The data in younger people that two doses is not sufficient um, is still kind of evolving. And um, I get the prudence principle and I get the NASI guidance is prudence around uh, looking at new variants and the like. But I think we just had to be very careful not to panic and think we have absolutely no protection in a 25-year-old healthy person at the six-month mark. We don't know that for sure yet. And and in people with normal, healthy, young immune systems, um, there is still uh, lots of immunity that hangs around. How much is the real question? And that's what we need to know next. Okay. I want to talk a, a, a little bit more about vaccines, just just generally the COVID-19 vaccines, how effective they are at preventing COVID-19 uh, infection or serious illness hospitalization, say, versus some of the other vaccines that people, before anyone ever heard of COVID-19, would be familiar with, you know, pertussis, MMR, flu shots, these kinds of things, Right. When you look at how effective these COVID-19 vaccines are, say in percentage terms, we hear that um, they're 76% effective or 80% effective, uh, um, pretty high numbers, generally speaking. How do, those, how do those efficacy numbers compare, say, to traditionally to some of the other vaccines? For example, it, it's been my experience uh, just in reading news reports about the flu vaccine, the, the seasonal flu shot, that the seasonal flu shot is usually nowhere near that effective at preventing someone from getting the flu. What do you think, doctor? Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely true. So I would say it's very difficult okay. uh, to compare between things because the diseases are different, the okay. viruses are different, and there is a lot of um, there's a lot of things that make that difficult to do. But for the take home message here of people out there wondering is this a worthwhile tool for my health maintenance and prevention of disease in me? Um, This is an exceptional tool. And to your point, um, sometimes with influenza virus um, and uh, the the flu vaccine, sometimes the match is not great. That's a virus that moves and shifts and drifts 
quite a bit. And sometimes the match is not great and the the relative impact of that um, vaccine is lower, although it's still incredibly useful, even in a quote unquote bad match year. Um, but this vaccine, to your point, especially against Delta and the original variants, is even more effective at preventing death and hospitalization. So all caveats to all the data and the reasons we shouldn't compare across vaccines all right. aside. Okay. The take home message is it's still a really, really quite amazing uh, vaccine, COVID, that is, in terms of its effectiveness. But flu is also still very useful. Okay. Omicron uh, has been in the news for about a week and a half. I mean, dominating the news. Um, What are your thoughts on it? What are you watching right now with that particular variant? What interests you as a researcher? Yeah, it um, it does have a lot of mutations. Um, that does not always necessarily mean that it's a more fit or effective virus. Uh, so the three things that I really keep an eye on with new variants in a virus situation like a pandemic are number one, how transmittable. Number two, how bad is the disease, either in vaccinated or unvaccinated people. And then number three, does the vaccine still maintain effectiveness against preventing very bad things, not so much just infection, but death and hospitalization? So those are the three things we're keeping an eye on for lab data on this variant and also real world data uh, as we watch how it spreads and moves around uh, around the uh, the globe. So those are the three things I'm looking at. I'm certainly still very concerned about this variant, but not panicked for sure. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Great to hear from you. Thank you for your help okay, this morning. Thank you. Yeah, bye bye. Uh, Dr. Lisa Barrett, infectious disease specialist and uh, also with the Department of Medicine at Dalhousie University, Halifax, Nova Scotia. When we come back, we'll talk about the economy. Uh, Bank of Canada will be in focus tomorrow with uh, an expected announcement on interest rates. We have a very strong labor market and uh, Wages are going up, which could also increase inflationary pressure. Strong inflation numbers as well, at a near 20-year high. So what is the Bank of Canada going to do? We'll speak with Pedro Antunes. He's chief economist at the Conference Board of Canada. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. I started, as I said, at Lester's Barber Shop, and it was kind of... um it was one of those things that it was just an opportune time for me to get into it just because he had decided that he was going to retire after the fire and then the opportunity presented itself that I could open my own shop and so um, I went from a 150 square foot space on St. Patrick Street to a 600 square foot space um, just on Beechwood to now here and I'm in a 1400 square foot space now and um, I don't know, it's been an interesting journey because you know you think that you're just gonna be just you or a really small space and then all of a sudden, you know, you've got ten other people working for you, you're in a much bigger space and even incorporating the boutique. Well, last March when all of this started, I mean we closed down a little bit earlier than everybody else and I'm gonna say, you know, being honest, part of it was social pressure. We we shut down before everybody else did and I'm watching all these other salons, you know, just be really responsible and say we don't want to be a part of the process. So we got ahead of it and, and closed and then, you know, the week later the government's like everybody's shutting down and So it was a little nerve wracking. I guess the first step of us, you know, trying to innovate and um, just keep moving forward was when the salon is closed, right? It's like, what do you do? Our Our whole industry is based on Um, being with people, cutting the hair, providing a service, you have to be people together to do that. You can't do that remotely at all. So um, one of the first things that I saw in our industry, what people were trying to do is they were selling their hair products that they had. And luckily I've had a website that always had a web store in the back. I just never used it. So as soon as I saw that people were doing that, I was like, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to load up all my stuff. And so that worked out really, really well. And then from there, I, I managed to find a place that was like a wholesale website that allowed you to have net 60 days. So you don't have to, you can order all the stuff.
staff. You don't have to prepay any of it. Um, you, there's free returns, all that. So that made it really easy for me to bring in other products and start trying to sell it. And uh, so I went from selling hair products to shave products to bath and body products to um, a little bit of clothing and jewelry. And now it's just morphed into this whole, like I want to make it a whole legit boutique. And uh, by December of last year, I decided that it, like this is a full fledged thing and we're going to separate it. It's its own company. So it's just, it's really finding an opportunity that's there and running with it. So it's been really fun. Our clients are loving it. Our clients that have been here for a long time, they love it. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. All eyes on the Bank of Canada this week with an interest rate announcement expected. What will the Bank of Canada do with its trend-setting rate? Pedro Antunes is Chief Economist Conference Board of Canada. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, it's great to hear from you, Pedro. What do you think the Bank of Canada will do this week? Well, I, I think uh, they're obviously, I, I suspect they will hold at where they are, essentially at uh, record low interest rates, rock bottom uh, low interest rates. Um, but they probably will signal that they are going to start to think about increasing interest rates in the new year. Um, I mean, a, a while back, we were thinking perhaps in the second or third quarter was when the, uh, the bank would uh, start to raise rates next year. Uh, but I think we're going to get some signals, perhaps, that uh, that will come ahead of that. Okay, okay. What data could the bank point to to justify, say, um, a more hawkish view of uh, monetary policy? Uh, in other words, I mean, it's already ended its bond buying program, uh, and now it appears as though it's ready to accelerate perhaps uh, tightening policy what 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 data does it have on its side to justify that yeah i think uh well i mean f first of all the bank uh, of canada is one of the few central banks across the uh, developed uh, world that has uh, at least eased, eased away on the quantitative easing. In other words, we're holding the bank balance sheet steady. Mm -hmm. uh, so that certainly is a little more tightening than it's been done in other areas. But I think you know what they're going to look at, or what they're looking at most prominently, is is the uh, is the recovery in labor markets. We've seen uh, employment really recover very quickly as the economy has reopened. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fiscal stimulus in the economy, as you and I have discussed in the past. That is the support programs that the federal government has put in place. A lot of money in the system right now. So we don't, I certainly believe, we don't need uh, as much monetary slack. And I think the, the bank will really point to the employment numbers as something that uh, suggests that the, the gap is closing. Right. You've got closed. employment numbers. You have inflation at a... 18 year high, mm -hmm. uh, you know, above the bank's target rate anyway, which is one to 3%, ideally 2%. Um, so, so that you would think there, those are two data points, but is Omicron a potential risk factor game changer? What, what, what's your sense of that, uh, Pedro? Well, I think for with respect to to the, uh, the to the this variant in particular, I mean nobody really knows at this point in time. I think there's a okay. lot of concern. Obviously, I, what we've seen wave after wave though has been that uh, these uh, impacts are lesser and lesser on the economy. Uh, we've learned, I guess, to to adjust to these things, and uh, you know, hopefully, we won't see too many uh, restrictions, health restrictions that uh, uh, cause harm to the economy. The other thing I would mention though is there's you know there are treatments. Uh, uh, for uh, COVID-19 coming along very quickly as well. So it's not just the vaccines now, the treatments are coming. Uh, so hopefully this will be, uh, you know, not, nothing that, um, first of all, it's, you know, that doesn't cause great uh, harm to, to people uh, in terms of their health, but also uh, that has a muted impact on the economy. Okay. The Bank of Canada is going to renew its mandate with the federal government for the next five years coming up soon here. And as you pointed out in a recent op-ed for the Globe and Mail, since the early 90s, the bank has had a mandate, keep infl it's been solely focused on inflation targeting. Keep inflation within 1% to 3% annualized, preferably 
two percent that's kind of the sweet spot and it has a great track record of being able to do that um now there the bank of canada is, is looking at other so-called uh mandates like do du a dual mandate for example we want to target inflation but we also want to have full employment um what 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 do you think the the bank of canada should do should it stick to the 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 traditional mandate that it has had or should it have this kind of dual mandate what what would be the best in your opinion for the bank of canada going forward well i i mean i think right now is just not the best time for a mandate renewal that would change things and the reason is that uh, you know right now we're struggling as with, as you mentioned with inflation and uh, you know the reason i didn't mention inflation earlier is because it is a global phenomenon and the bank is probably you know limited in what it can or thinks it might be able to do around uh, around inflation right off the bat uh, but uh, you know i think the timing is just not right for changing the mandate because one of the things that the bank relies on the most is essentially uh, anchoring inflation and that means that people believe that the Bank of Canada has been successful in the past and will continue to be successful at maintaining inflation low and thus you know they don't ratchet up wages or they don't expect their wages to ratchet up and prices don't ratchet up to match that what, what we don't want is that vicious cycle so the belief that the, that the Bank of Canada will keep inflation at two percent even if there's this temporary increase is really important to the bank essentially in, in maintaining its uh, its targets so I think this the timing is not good because you know the perception might be oh you know the bank is allowing for more inflation because they're having trouble managing it and I just just don't think the timing is right okay. uh, to let up on on that uh, on that uh, you know essentially on that mandate We've talked in the past, uh, Pedro, about uh, the incredible jump in the savings rate over the course of the pandemic um, compared to traditionally what it was, which was in like the low single digits. Traditionally, what would the savings rate be in Canada? 1% or something like that, right? Around yes, that, that's right. That's right. It, I mean, it was north of 20% during the pandemic when people were locked in, had nowhere to spend money, nowhere to travel, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And even in the last quarter, uh, we just got the data from Statistics Canada for Q3 of 2021, the, yeah. the, uh, the savings rate remains above 10%. So above it's 10%. A really, very, yeah. very healthy savings that yeah. essentially we're, we put away $210 billion in, in 2020. We're continuing to put, we think, probably around $100 billion that we're socking away, really, uh, to be able to spend at a later date. Um, and, but I uh, guess what I want to get at is what kind of uh, cushion is that for Canadians to be able to absorb, say, a higher interest rate, if higher interest rates? Say there's three interest rate hikes next year, uh, which brings the, the, you know, the, the trend setting rate up to, you know, a whopping 1% or something. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, how prepared are Canadians because of these savings to, to kind of uh, handle those interest rate hikes? Well, yeah, I think three interest rate hikes or even four would not be a, a you know tragic for for households or for more most households across Canada. There's there's two reasons uh, that I think that's the case, and one is that a lot of the savings that we've accumulated we have put towards uh, credit card debt and short term debt. Uh, where we've seen the ratcheting up in debt uh, through this pandemic uh, has been in in mortgage debt, um, and despite the fact that we've put this savings aside, you know we've seen households take on a lot more mortgage debt, and the housing markets have been really on fire. Uh, over the last year. So uh, the reason I'm less concerned about that is because there are stress tests that say if you're going to take on a mortgage, you have to take on a mortgage with a, a fairly high in, uh, interest rate. Uh, you have to test for that and, and be able to yeah. handle that in, in terms of your income so that there's some room there uh, when interest rates uh, go up. The other piece that's important is if you look at mortgage rates and five-year mortgage rates in particular, they've already ratcheted it up quite quickly. So the market is already expecting first of all you know longer bond yields have come up uh, there's concern about interest rates in the future so even though central banks have kept short-term rates low we have seen uh, you know the longer yields and the, you know essentially the rates that consumers pay already come up a fair bit so you know I, I don't see that three or four interest rate hikes as a crisis for households in Canada okay Maybe more of a crisis for provincial governments, <laughs> if anything, Pedro. Well, I, uh, uh, maybe. I, I mean, that's an op-ed for another day, maybe, yeah. 
You're, you're right. I, I do think there's uh, certainly a lot of concern about the amount of debt and the fiscal situation that we've taken on in this country. And uh, yes, there's going to be some challenges down the road, no doubt. Okay. Thank you again. Great to hear from you. It's my pleasure, Rob. Thanks yeah. for uh, thanks for having me on the show. So we'll uh, we'll be following up on that tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be a big day. Not so much. I, I don't think there's anybody in the country who expects the Bank of Canada to suddenly come out surprising the entire market with an interest rate hike. Like it's just not going to happen. It's about what the Bank of Canada says after the announcement. It's we're not raising interest rates, and here's why. Or 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 it's it telegraphs what the monetary policy is going to be going forward, and this is when you can anticipate interest rates to start moving higher. Most of the economists, like Pedro, uh, anticipate there will be interest rate hikes next year. That's why uh, we're going to follow up on that story tomorrow. It'll be an early uh, story tomorrow. That usually drops around 8.30, 9 o'clock, something like that. Uh, Pedro Antunes, Chief Economist Conference Board of Canada. That's it for the Rob Snow Show. Uh, noon news, complete news update coming up here. And then the Sam LaPrade Show. To keep you going throughout the afternoon here on City News. The Rob Snow Show. Weekdays at 9 on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. to you by Ignite TV.